thank you all for coming. Uh, I hope that everybody enjoyed the food and got a chance to mingle and we talk with our members of our team as well as our partners. You'll be hearing from three presenters today. First up will be Mike Richmond. Michael is a sales executive for Risk Advisory Solutions with B. Horton Group, which is a Chicago-based insurance, employee benefits, and risk advisory firm. He analyzes every detail of a client's business to determine its exposure. With that, he provides risk management programs that contain the business's liability. Um, as an attorney, Mike understands the legal exposure that companies face in addition to the countless ways that they can affect business. Second, we'll have Todd Rowe with Tressler LLP. Todd practices law in the field of insurance coverage. He specializes in cyber risk insurance claims, working with underwriters on policy provisions and counseling clients on issues in this emerging area of law. Todd um, also counsels clients on the potential for cyber risk liability and compliance with state and federal privacy laws. He is a regular contributor to Tressler's Privacy Report blog. Our final presenter today is President and CEO of Andromeda Technology Solutions, Jeff Borello. For over 20 years, Jeff has been responsible for overall company direction and development of strategic partnerships in Andromeda. He is co-author of the book, Pain-Free IT Support. You guys will notice that we've included a free version of that for you guys in your little goodie bags. Jeff, along with his two co-founders, Pat McDonald and Bill Butts, established Andromeda Technology Solutions in 1994, Chicagoland's premier technology solution provider. Uh, specializing in managed services, cybersecurity, and disaster recovery, Andromeda provides full-service IT, telecommunications, and security solutions customized to your business and your needs. We've scheduled for about 90 minutes of presentation today, so sit tight, um, followed by a 30-minute Q&A session, so please make sure we provide some notepads in front of you. Feel free to take down any questions that may have. We will answer all of those at the end. We do have the room for the day, so we'll stay as long as you guys have questions. We're more than willing to stay and answer those. And then finally, we are going to be hosting that raffle we mentioned at the beginning. I believe everybody was entered. If anybody didn't get a chance to enter and I missed you, make sure to come see me. We're going to be giving away that Echo gift card and the 35-point network security assessment. So thank you guys very much, and without further ado, my Richmond. Thanks, Andy. Um, Andromeda, thanks, thanks for hosting us. We, we really appreciate that. Um, as I mentioned, um, I have kind of a cyber insurance practice at the Horton Group. Um, we, we're, you know, we do risk advisory for all types of organizations, but I found that cyber liability is kind of the biggest focus for organizations right now. Probably just the most unknown, but then also misunderstood. Um, but then also, it's really turning into the biggest exposure, and people are realizing that. Some of the misconceptions that existed before small or I don't have information that needs to be protected, I'm not a target, you know, those types of misconceptions don't really exist anymore. But I always get like to get a show of hands in the room and a sense of who understands the insurance aspect and who actually has it. But I want to ask it this question in a certain way because I do not want to expose everybody here to ransomware attacks. Because obviously if you have it then people will want to attack you against money. But who here knows if they have cyber liability insurance in place at their company? That's fantastic. Um, it's about half the room when I usually give these presentations, so you know this, this, this group is, is right there. Um, this presentation, there, there's several sections to it. We have 15 minutes, so we're not going to get through all of it. But I want to invite everybody to contact me when you, when you leave. There's a, a brochure that we put together called Cybersecurity Decoded. On the back page it has my contact information. If there's anything that you don't get from this presentation that we maybe didn't cover or it doesn't come up in the Q&A, and certainly write down questions and questions in the Q&A, feel free to reach out to me directly, and I'm happy to address those. So to get started, here's our agenda. So we're gonna talk about insurance coverage. Um, importantly, what are the components of a cyber liability policy and the crime policy, and why they're different? And then also the big issue we see nowadays that is never covered, it seems, is social engineering, we'll get to that. And then kind of the insurance approach to cyber risk, how to properly structure those two policies. Um, the examples we probably won't get through, but we can go through those offline anytime. And then some items to kind of watch for when you do buy cyber liability insurance. So, common question I get, at least now people are starting to get it, is doesn't general liability cover this? Well, 
it doesn't. The distinguishing factor between general liability and then pretty much a lot of other liability policies, it could be professional liability, cyber liability, fiduciary liability. General liability covers bodily injury and property damage caused by tangible means. Your car runs under something. Your you know, the bomb you manufacture at your manufacturing plant explodes. Whatever the case might be, that causes some type of bodily injury and property damage. And virus hacking, other data breaches are deemed electronic in nature and, and therefore intangible. So there have been cases, and, and certainly Todd can go into more detail, he's, he's been a part of some, some of those cases in the past, that talked about, okay, so a breach happened, general liability should cover this. These cases are over litigated from years past, and every single general liability policy has taken those into account to make sure that no matter what the precedent says, general liability will never cover cyber liability events. I'm sure something will slip through the cracks here and there, but that's the general consensus. So, where is coverage found for cyber risk? First, a cyber liability and data breach policy. That's gonna cover third party, first party, and then social engineering losses. When you think about insurance from a cybersecurity perspective, you have to really think of it in three buckets. So you have your third party risk. That's where somebody's going to sue you because you had a breach and you had their information and had a fiduciary duty to protect that information, and now they're susceptible to some type of a loss, right? So your third party, that's what everybody thinks about. Then you have a first party. That's going to be, okay, so your network shut down, now you can't serve your clients, you can't manufacture your widgets, you can't distribute your product, so you're losing money because of that. That's number two. Often, manufacturers you know, are a great example of that. It's not thought of. They're not a bank or a hospital or somebody who has you know, protected information, so they think, I don't need cyber liability insurance. But the first party component is important as well. The third tranche is gonna be essentially monetary loss, so bank fraud, fraudulent inducement, fraudulent instruction, social engineering, ways that you can lose money um, outside of business interruption. Somebody goes into your bank account and steals that money or convinces you to give them money through some type of cyber means. That's the third area, largely misunderstood, even in my industry. So people, my, my peers, don't understand it, and oftentimes I find most businesses I meet with don't have the proper coverage for it. We're gonna show you how to do that today. The second way to protect yourself is with, through a commercial crime policy. This covers all of the, the bank fraud, the social engineering. This is the best way to do it. We'll go into more detail. Okay, so components of a cyber liability policy. So we start with our first party, our third party liability, which is network safety, network, network, network information security, regulatory defense expenses and fines. So there are 50 carriers that offer this coverage. They all have different terminology for this. So this is essentially what I put together as kind of the general consensus of what these terms are. So, and then the one thing about cyber policies, unlike general liability, every carrier uses a very similar or the same, in fact, general liability form. And then the insurance services office basically says, okay, well here's all the endorsements you can add or subtract, and everyone kind of follows and abides by those guidelines. With cyber liability, everyone has a different form. Nobody follows any set guidelines at all. That probably won't change to be nice as it did and make everyone's life easier. But to start with network and information security, this is that comment, okay, so you have a network, you have information on this network, it could be employees, it could be customers, it could be vendors, and you have a breach, now that information is exposed. Somebody's gonna bring suit against you saying, you had, you know, my information didn't protect it, I might have some type of loss in the future based on that, and now I'm going to sue you. So that's what everyone thinks about cyber liability, there's your core coverage. Regulatory defense expenses and fines. So let's say that you are in a healthcare organization, have over 100,000 records, you have a breach, it turns out you're negligent in protecting that information, and now the Department of Health and Human Services is gonna come after you for 10, 20, 30,000 know, HIPAA violations. So coverage for that as well as the investigation costs. And that's largely what's covered by third party liability. First party liability, there's several components. So number one, network business interruption. This is that coverage where you have a breach, it shuts you down, you can't operate, and you lose income because of it. Similar to a property policy, where your building burns down and now you can't operate, loss of business income because of that, it's the same thing, but from a hacking event. That coverage is not found on a property policy. Another misconception, similar to cyber, or similar to general liability, business interruption is not for due to network events or data breaches, are not covered under a property policy. Second, notification costs. Every state has a different rule for this. In Illinois, you have a 
Todd can answer this question probably better than I can or give more guidance, but you know, you have a reasonable amount of time when you have a breach to send notice to all potentially affected individuals, all of your customers, um, your employees, what have you. The cost for that. So firms that actually, that's what they do. You can so you obtain this firm and this provides coverage for you to pay that firm, do the mailing, the postage, you know, pulling the, the, the filling the envelopes and whatnot. Crisis management, this is what I refer to as the um, Say it, Crane's Morning 10 coverage. So let's say you sustain a breach and you send notice out to all potentially affected customers, employees. Well, as it turns out, those people know people, you know, it eventually makes its way to Wall Street Journal, Chicago Tribune, Crane's uh, Chicago Business. And then it's inevitable, like who here has a Crane's Morning 10 subscription? Or a Crane subscription, better. It's Carl, that's one. <laughs> so the reason I have it is every morning I can wake up and say, you know, for any meetings I go to in, in, during the day, I'm going to sound very educated because boom, 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 okay, that's what's happening in Chicago. It takes you 10 minutes and you're up to speed. Um, but inevitably, once a week, it seems, there's somebody had a cyber loss. And the wording usually goes, they had a cyber loss, this is what they do. We reached out to them and they were unavailable for comment. Now that sounds terrible, right? Especially with the cyber breach because you're sitting there thinking, well, man, I probably don't want to do business with that organization. They're not protecting information and so on. This coverage, and, and, and working in tandem with the firm, this is an incident response program, so you know who you're contacting, you know you want to pay for these people, but basically it pays for a PR that would know exactly what to do. So I work for, you know, court, right? We used to say a breach, we contact that PR firm, they already know everything we do, it's built into our incident response program, they can contact all the media outlets and say we had a breach, we know about it, we're taking proactive measures to protect our customers by putting together credit monitoring and IT you know, security and, what not for those customers, and here's how we've identified how it happened, and we've identified how we're going to fix it. That sounds a lot better than I'm available for comment. And you can have this all set up in an incident response program, and you can actually have this policy fund. So that's what that covers. Data restoration, pretty common. So if you lose software, your hardware's knocked out, you can go pay for some of that. Cyber extortion, um, so ransomware, crypto locker, wanna cry, click on a link and it knocks out your network. If you haven't been backing up routinely, daily, hourly, it'll pay for the ransom where the, 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 the ransom payment if you have to actually go through that measure. Let's say you hadn't been backing, backing it up, or you thought that it was, and it turns out there was a glitch in the system and it hasn't been backing up for the past month. It'll pay for the ransom. PCI fines and expenses. I used to not even bother putting this in here, but then we started noticing that you know there was sometimes the losses, believe it or not, were higher for PCI losses than it was for even network and information security. You can be a restaurant, and it turns out that you're not properly, you're not PCI compliant, so you have a loss. Nobody really sustains any loss from a third party perspective, but it turns out you violated all your PCI agreements with all your, you know, your credit card partners. Next thing you know, you got $500,000 or $500, million dollars of fines from that. Regard. So it's something to focus on as well. Now, social engineering, fraudulent destruction, fraudulent inducement. These are those types of losses where you get an email from a vendor that says, I'm vendor XYZ, we work together all the time, and you usually get an invoice every once a month. Go ahead and make payment for 20,000, 30,000, whatever it is, to this location, or to this account. Um, accounts payable say, well, I've always worked with this vendor, so I'm gonna go ahead and send it. Um, then that vendor reaches out to you two weeks later and says, here's our invoice for last month. And like, well, I've already paid that. No, you didn't. All that money, we, we didn't send that to you. They forward, they forward, you forward the email to them and they say, that's not us. I'm not sure that is, you should look into that. You still owe us our, our invoice. So these losses actually happen more than you would think. Um, in fact, I'm seeing more of these than anything else right now. And it's really unfortunate because what's happening is most times companies don't have this coverage or it's written incorrectly. So this is the biggest caveat that you can look at take from this presentation. I put it here and I can the following previous slide I said social engineering would be covered under a cyber liability policy, maybe. The reason I say maybe is that this coverage is just now kind of getting baked into cyber liability policies. It wasn't it's not a traditional cyber liability policy. The difference between social engineering and anything else is you're giving away the money. And everything else somebody's stealing from you. In social engineering, somebody's saying, send me fifty thousand dollars. And then they're they're saying, okay, I'll send you fifty thousand dollars. Insurance companies don't want to pay for stupidity being a, kind of a direct statement, that's the best way to say it. They, they really, from a public policy perspective, they want you to have 
the accounts payable protocols in place to make sure that you don't fall victim to this. So what cyber liability policies do now is they'll include some coverage. In fact, they'll toss in $100,000 of this coverage for free. But they all, every cyber liability coverage or social engineering coverage includes a very important exclusion. It's referred to as a verification or authentication exclusion. It works this way. It says, we'll pay $100,000 in the event that you pick up the phone and call the purported vendor to authenticate the request, make sure it's valid. Well, let's think about that practically, right? If you pick up the, had to pick up the phone every time you call, what's that vendor going to say? Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, sure, that's it's us, go ahead and pay. They're going to make sure that, that, did we actually send that to you? Oh, no, we didn't. Don't make that payment because that's their money. And let's say you go and solve it within the next two weeks and they, they, you know, and they don't get that payment, they're going to wish they look back and, and make sure that they verify that themselves. So they have a vested interest. So you pick up the phone and call and you have to call every time, you almost never sustain the cost. Granted, one or two might slip through the cracks, but it almost renders the coverage useless. Does that make sense? We can certainly talk about it more during the Q&A, but I want to talk through why this, the crime policy would be better. So, I'm not saying the crime policy would replace the cyber liability policy, but the crime policy does is it works in conjunction with the cyber liability policy. But you still have to cover three important areas, computer crime, funds transfer fraud, social engineering. I always start with funds transfer fraud because that was pretty easy to explain. Somebody in, in your network, an employee, clicks on a link, gives, a, a, gives exposes the network to malware, gives a hacker access, right? Hackers rummaging around for 10, 20, 143 days, which I hear is the average, and you know, finds logins and passwords for various programs, including your online bank. He waits until overnight, puts a transfer in for $100,000 to an offshore account in Russia. Bank doesn't find out about it until the next day, so they don't call back and, and, and authenticate it. Or your agreement with your bank is for $200,000 for a callback verification. So they're not even bothered, they're not bothering to pay attention. So once you realize that it was a fraudulent request, they, you, know, you, you contacted the bank, you get money back, you can't get any of it, or you can only call back X amount. So now you've lost that money, okay? Under the Uniform Commercial Code, which everyone pretty much buys, every state buys by to some extent, the bank doesn't have to pay you back. It's not like a personal bank account where the UCC, if you're a person, you're less sophisticated, we want to protect you, you know, it's public policy to protect you, we'll give you that money back. As a business, you're getting more sophisticated, and you know, unless the bank was commercially unreasonable in protecting your account, which I can tell you now, they have 10 attorneys on staff making sure they're not at all times, but that they are reasonable at all times, um, they're not gonna provide coverage, we're not gonna pay that. So that's why that coverage is important. Computer crime, the difference there is that it's somebody's manipulating a network or a system to divert funds. So they're using the system against you, the, the, the network against you. Basically, you're paying you have some vendor on automatic payments or employee payroll or what have you. Somebody goes into the network and, and changes the codes. There's going to be a, an employee's routing number or what have you to a separate routing number. So instead of them going into your account and stealing your money, they are just basically manipulating the network, money, money sent, and diverts to another account. That's computer crime. It's a minimal distinction. And then in crime policies, you can get social engineering coverage there too. And they will go up to 250,000 max versus the 100,000 that's usually capped on a cyber liability policy. And they will remove the verification exclusion. But you have to ask for it because this is how it goes when we, are, when we typically go to a book hearing. Hey, we would like to get a crime policy. Okay, great, thanks. Send your crime crime report. Then you're going through it and it's like, well, there's no social engineering coverage here. Everyone knows you need to have that nowadays. So you go back and you say, hey, I want, I want social engineering coverage. They come back with like 50,000 in coverage and a $10,000 deductible. You say, okay, so that's terrible limits, and you included the exclusion on that. So can you give me my 250 and 10,000 deductible and remove the exclusion? Because nowadays, like in our firm, we've, built, we've kind of baked this out with a few top carriers and said, anytime somebody comes to you and asks for crime, you have to include this because we don't want to get sued for not having this coverage for our clients. But oftentimes, you'll find your crime policy doesn't have this. If you can have a crime policy, because a lot of times people don't have this coverage. So that's how you take cyber liability and crime and mold those together. So I know I'm up on time here. So these are all the examples, and we'll skip over those. We can talk about those offline. But there's a couple quick things to think about from what to look for. Number one, encryption exclusions. These are things that underwriters almost always toss up policies that you want to have removed. Mm -hmm. Encryption exclusions, uh, exclusions for failure to update and maintain software. Granted, you want to have these policies in place. They're not going to remove the exclusions if you're not encrypting things. 
where you're not, you know, at least have a policy in place to maintain updated software. But there are glitches in systems, right? If there's a glitch in, let's say, the software that you're using to maintain and patch your network, you shouldn't be, that shouldn't be your fault. You should have coverage for that. So you want to make sure the, the exclusions are removed. Inclusion of paper files, uh, vicarious liability for data entrusted to vendors. So when breaches happen on vendor systems, somebody's backing up your data, you want to have coverage in case they need to come and solve it. Because if they have a breach, then they're probably going to come and solve it because they have you know, identification agreements with all their customers. Uh, contractual liability exclusions, exclusions for certain government entities, go back to you know, um, coverage. Sublimits. So again, talking about PCI, don't have 100,000 PCI coverage and a million of, of network information security coverage. Have a million for everything. The carrier won't charge you much more to do that. But again, there's times where your PCI, your PCI loss or your crisis management loss might be higher than the other lines. So make sure everything's up to the same level. Records count restrictions. Make sure to calculate a potential cost of a breach based on record count. Work with your cybersecurity firms to determine that. Uh, callback provisions again, talking about those for social engineering. And then you know, these carriers, all of them offer you know, coverage for you know, pre claim assistance, services, devices, incident response programs. They'll actually help pay for a lot of the work that you can, can do with third party cybersecurity firms. So just you know, take, take advantage of that. So the QA will come up later on. So certainly appreciate your time and I look forward to your questions. Thanks.
ransomware on our home computers or, or um, being caught up in having your credit card be part of a batch of credit card numbers that were, you know, from Target that were hacked, that type of thing. So everyday examples are helping us. I gave a link here. Sometimes I like to head out to the internet during a presentation, which always makes everybody squirm, including myself. But this link is really nice because you can see attacks as they go, as they're happening um, right there on the spot. You can see where the attacks are originating from. They have a map. So it's really worth checking out there. The high profile breaches. You know, uh, when we were doing this presentation maybe four or five years ago, we talked about Target and Best Buy. And I can see everybody's faces in the you know, in the audience saying, well, I'm not Target, I'm not Best Buy, I don't have that type of data, so I should be safe. So, you know, everybody's able to discount our great presentations, but we're, we're starting to embrace that a little bit more, these high profile, profile breaches, because it gets us talking about things a little bit. When, we, when WikiLeaks uh, disposes a bunch of CIA information, uh, yeah, you're not the CIA, the CIA probably has really good safeguards in place. But we're talking about these issues and, and, and how it can impact everything. So we're, we're talking about high profile breaches now in small and, business, small and medium sized businesses because we think that's important. High profile decisions, that's something that's really important to me. Uh, a few years ago, I would have no law to talk about. Uh, there's no cases, nothing. Uh, but as we stand here today, we're seeing some really interesting cases develop into a great body of law. I'll touch on them, but we really could do a presentation for an hour on end about the law and the statutes and the different things. But So this makes our lives easier as well. And small data, that's a term that I'm starting to use a little bit more. You know, I don't know, I watch you know, the Sunday morning news shows and you always see like IBM commercials where it's talking about big data this and big data that. And it allows us to discount kind of like, I'm not big data, so I don't care. But as we start to get more involved with breach responses and, and the coverage aspects of things. So one thing I do notice for small and medium-sized businesses is the importance of small data. Small data attracts small hackers who can do just as much damage. I mean, maybe it's not on the scale of Best Buy, but when you're running a smaller business, um, it can cause a lot of damage as far as business interruption and things like that. So small data is something that we should really be thinking a lot about. So let's try to talk a little bit about these terms. Uh, so what does a breach mean? Um, once again, breach, kind of an inarticulate term, the same way cyber is. But we do have a little bit more direction here with PIPA. So PIPA is the Illinois Personal Information Protection Act. So the Illinois legislature has stepped in and kind of given us some guidance on data protection things of that nature. And they tell us, as far as PIPA is concerned, is that a breach is the unauthorized acquisition of computerized data that compromises the security, confidentiality, or integrity of personal information maintained by the data collector. So thank you, Illinois legislature, for clearing that up for us. Um, but I think we can get away from these terms a little bit by just saying, what does a breach really look like? What are we seeing uh, out in the field day in and day out? So you, you can have a breach of data, which is bad, and that could be your customer information or your employee information, um, your business secrets or ideas, anything like that. That's kind of the more classical um, type breach. Somebody got credit card information, that type of thing. We all see that. But as these things evolve, we are starting to see loss or damage to assets become a problem. And you say, well, how can we have a physical asset our, our building or our facility actually sustain real property damage. And really simple, the Internet of Things, with the way we have everything interconnected, uh, our thermostats are connected to the Internet. The minute you make that connection, you just opened it up to hackers, uh, Lord knows where. So that thermostat, for example, can you go to Florida, just take your house, for, for a quick example, you go to Florida for the winter, your house is up here in Illinois, Hacker gets in, they manipulate that NAS thermostat, take the heat way down, bust your pipes, they freeze, they cause physical damage. So there's a hacker actually causing physical damage. And we are seeing that with um, different uh, industries, the manufacturing sector, as far as you know, business, um, machines that are connected to report back to uh, the manufacturer about the productivity of that machine. When you have that, that connection to the internet, you're opening yourself up to Lord knows what. So that's where we 
aware of that. Business interruption. This is really becoming a, um, a real difficult thing for small and medium-sized businesses as far as when you're dealing with these problems, uh, even if you survive and nobody destroys your data or encrypts your data, you're still down for a couple of days and you're still, you don't have employees working, you have employees focusing on different things. So the loss or the business interruption is really something that we're seeing a, a lot of businesses struggle with right now. Cyber extortion, ransomware, um, things of that nature, uh, that is another type of breach that we're dealing with um, quite a bit as well. And theft, just old school pure theft, you know. You get an email that says, hey, I want to, you know, from a former employee that says, make sure, you know, you distribute money out of my 401k. You make that distribution to a bank. Lo and behold, nobody ever even just picked up the phone and just called that former employee to say, hey, do you really want this distribution? The tax documents come out the following April. The employee calls up and says, what's the deal? You transfer 20G out of my 401k and I didn't authorize it. You know, that type of thing. Um, so that's all cyber and breach. That's what we're really facing as we sit here today. Just, we talked a little bit about this. The one thing I want to stress out of here is um, you know, being a practitioner in this area, it's not all high tech and sexy Russian, like, you know, hacking type thing. We're seeing a lot, the vast majority of our issues are very unsophisticated employees who have too much information, access to too much information, too many cooks in the kitchen, and taking the information that they should. Very unsophisticated, no hacking, none of those types of things. So that's really the situation that we're seeing quite a bit. Uh, mailing W-2s to the wrong spot. It's pretty pretty much old, st old school stuff like that that we're really still seeing uh, that the need for insurance coverage or definitely forensics people and poor counsel. So. Mike touched on it earlier, also the vendors as far as um, you don't have control over those vendors, and that's, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to control the data within your own system, let alone a third-party vendor. So that's another issue that we're seeing a lot as far as in our practice. So let's get to some of the law and it. Um, legal liability, really quick, just to sum up where legal liability comes from, it's when you have that fiduciary relationship with someone, they've entrusted you with their information. So you'll see customers, they entrust you with their credit card number or anything along those lines. So there's where we're seeing the legal liability. And then we're seeing employees. They entrust you with so much information and we really don't even think about it. I mean, as employers of small or medium-sized businesses, we, we take in medical information, which is subject to HIPAA, which is just toxic in the scheme of things. I mean, if HIPAA information, HIPAA protected information gets out, you gotta go around. So, to sum up legal liability, this is where we're looking at. It's that fiduciary relationship that you're you're sharing with your customers, your employees. Uh, really quick litigation examples. What we're seeing a lot of right now, just pure litigation of these issues, is questions about standing. So what that is, it's uh, just like it sounds. Do you have standing to bring a lawsuit? So we have plaintiffs who were uh, involved in a data breach, and they try to sue whoever it is that they allege breached that material. The courts are looking at this now and saying, okay, we don't know if you have standing to bring this suit in the first place. And, and there's a quick test I can give you. It's called from, it's from a Supreme Court case, US Supreme Court case, it's called Spokio. Uh, we, we address these issues a lot more in depth and in a more sort of an easier way to understand our law. So feel free to take a look at that. But the first element is just whether or not you have been able to establish a risk of harm. And, and what that means is, okay, so there was a breach. Target breached your credit card information. Can you show that it was used in some bad way by people? And there's a lot of hurdles to get over uh, as far as plans are concerned here because they have to show when the breach happened, which Target or whoever the company is is going to control that information, who took the information, and how they're using it. So you have to be able to show all that. We're seeing a lot of cases go down on what you call motion to dismiss, meaning you can't even get past the pleading stages on this. So that's where we are with the litigation aspects of it. Neiman Marcus case was a great standing case here in the Seventh Circuit, which has Chicago. Uh, we thought we were gonna get some great law on that, and lo and behold, they settled. Um, and with the funny thing about Neiman Marcus is when they settled with all these plaintiffs who were involved in the Neiman Marcus, who Neiman Marcus had a breach and their credit card information was taken. 
the class action plaintiffs took home about 300 bucks or so. So not the most lucrative thing. I'm sure the lawyers did quite well for themselves, but it wasn't the uh, plaintiffs who did well. One quick thing, I should actually really quickly talk about uh, litigation involving insurance coverage because we have a great case called Cottage Health, which uh, CNA issued a policy to Cottage Health, which was a hospital, and then lo and behold, that Cottage Health had a breach. And they tendered it to their uh, insurance carrier saying we had a breach. Well, CNA denied coverage, saying there was an endorsement in that policy that said that you have to continuously uh, update and implement safeguards. And while you had this particular safeguard, it was a patch or something. While you had it when you got the policy, you didn't continuously update that patch. So they were able to deny coverage. Um, for, um, for, uh, Cottage Health settled, so we didn't get good law out of that. But you can see that even when you have an expert like Mike on the insurance side or myself, you still need a tech person there to even help you just get through the insurance and what um, requirements you have for the insurance. So we talked a little bit about the case law. There's a little bit of it out there. Let's talk really quickly about what the standards are. So this is our issue here. I mean, federal standards, you can have information that would be subject to HIPAA, medical information, Securities and Exchange Commission, banking information, Federal Trade Commission, whatever. So not much harmony there between the laws. But before I end, I do want to talk about uh, PIPA, which we talked about earlier. We also in Illinois have BIPA, which is the Biometric Information Act. So, Illinois is really leading the way on the biometric information. So things like thumbprints to identify uh, customers, things like that. That's all going to be protected as data under HIPAA. But let's talk quickly about HIPAA. On January 1st, HIPAA was amended to require data collectors to take reasonable measures to protect uh, data. And so what does reasonable measures mean? I have no idea. Um, we're gonna find out. I hope it's nobody in this room that sort of pushes that case along to help us find out. But we're gonna find out what reasonable security measures mean. But in the meantime, I can help you out a little bit. We can just talk really quickly about HIPAA. Um, a data collector, as defined under HIPAA, is everybody. It's government agencies, public and private universities, privately and publicly held corporations, financial institutions, retail operators, oh, and any other entity. So, if you're sitting here and you're in business, you're, you are subject to, uh, um, what's the type of information that needs to be protected? It's called personal information under the Act. And that is defined as a first name or first initial and last name in combination with any of the other following identifiers. Social security number, driver's license number, and state ID number, our account number, and credit card number, and there's some other things there too. So basically anything that we would really think of as private information is going to be protected. HIPAA also provides a little recipe for us if you have a breach and the requirements that you need to go through to notify uh, all of the people who are involved in the breach requires legal counsel. I'm sorry, there's no other way around. You need to set up perhaps, no matter your size, if you're a data collector, you're subject to this. You need to perhaps, you need to look at issues as to whether or not you need to set up a call center. So, um, you know, luckily we've poor, we coordinated at this point with vendors who can help us do call centers, 800 numbers. You gotta look at whether or not you need to provide credit counseling to those that were involved, your employees, which is, in some of the breaches that we've dealt with is always kind of a little tricky situation because you have these employees that are, I always hear, oh, they're like family. These employees are like family, you know, and you wanna take care of them, and that's great. But now you gotta look at them and you gotta know you just gave their information to like a Ukrainian hacker or something like that. So the requirements, you can't just say, hey, we had a breach. It really has to be very closely, really laid out here. Um, and then, uh, so that's where we are with that as far as it was concerned. Feel free to give me a call and <clears throat> talk about that anytime. Uh, what does a cyber incident mean for your company? Here I just want to make sure that everybody had a handout as far as to show how your internal and external team should be working together. So, um, there we are with that. So what are we looking at for 2017? Uh, we're gonna see a lot more breaches through the internet of things, as we call it, uh, no matter what your size, we're gonna see that. Uh, 
information that must be protected will evolve. It won't be just this laundry list of items that we see in PIPA. Um, we're going to see some cases, I think, that aren't these items, but people are going to say, that was very private information to me, and you breached that in some fashion. So we're going to see this evolve a little bit. Hopefully, data breach requirements and insurance requirements will harmonize so we can give good guidance. When somebody comes into their lawyer's office, the lawyer can say, oh, here's your, your you know, what you need to do under FTC regulations. So hopefully we'll see some of that. And just small data. I think the days are over where we can say, I'm a small, medium-sized business person. I don't know if that's how our inter internal voice calls ourselves, small to business, but whatever the case. I'm a smaller business person. I'm not Target. I'm not Best Buy. I shouldn't be subjected to this. Well, we are, we are, and we should take some precautions. As long as you have even one employee and one customer, there needs to be some safeguards that are put in place. So, happy to answer any questions that you have uh, afterward. We're going to stick around, so thank you for your time. Just want to thank uh, Todd and Mike real fast. Uh, another round of applause for them. That'd be great. <laughs> it's also nice when you can get a, a lawyer and an insurance lawyer up there before me to make the computer guy seem like things are simple. That's very, uh, very rare that happens. So I appreciate that. Hey, real quick, why don't you everyone stand up, stretch a little bit. Let's get the blood flowing a little bit after a little lunch and after a little bit of that insurance stuff. That stuff, that stuff's heavy. You guys are rough. <laughs> Because I figure there's at least a 60% chance I'm going to put you to sleep. So, all right, cool. So, ladies and gentlemen, you are under attack. Right? You're under attack. Your business is under attack. Your office is under attack. Everything's under attack. So, uh, hopefully, I have your attention now. Anyway. Uh, one of the reasons we don't do this at 8 a.m. is that red alert noise is just too much for the Trekkies out there that know that's a red alert noise, but uh, just a little too much before you've had your coffee. So, uh, As Abby mentioned, I'm Jeff Borello, uh, CEO and one of the co-founders of Andromeda Technology Solutions. We started out in 1994. Uh, I'm a techie guy. I have a technical background. Uh, I have a Bachelor's of Science degree from Lewis University. I don't believe this campus existed back when I was there. It was a little, little while ago. Um, Certainly, as you can see, I am not much to look at, so I will try to do my best to make up for that with some decent content, hopefully. So uh, I want to thank a couple of our sponsors that, that helped put this on. Uh, Datto is our business continuity and disaster recovery partner. That's what has become the fancy name for what used to be called backup, but just having backup isn't really good enough anymore, so they've put a fancier name on it. Shockingly enough, we haven't put a good acronym on that yet. I don't know why. It's unusual for us computer guys. And then Webroot. Uh, Webroot is part of our layered security package, and I will talk a little bit uh, later about what that means, uh, what a layered security package is, but they're a very good partner of ours, uh, providing some good protection for our customers. So, um, as Abby already mentioned, uh, we're going to take a Q&A panel at the end, bring Todd and Mike back up, and we'll take any questions you got. You got a pad and paper uh, in front of you, or a pad and paper, how about a pad and pen? Uh, so write down any questions you got, and we will knock those off uh, at the end. I want to thank Abby and Nicolette and the rest of the team for all the work they've done putting us on. So a quick round of applause for them. Thank you, guys. A lot of, a lot of work goes into this. All I can do is show up and talk, so I got the easy part. So kind of broken up into three sections, a little bit of intro, a little bit of background. Uh, that Todd and Mike really already touched on some of that, so I'll probably breeze through that. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the entry points on how these hackers get into your business and how to get into your, into your items. And then at the end, I'm going to give you some tips, hopefully, to prevent some of that and give you some sound advice to, to keep sleeping well. All right, so here's the bad news. We already talked about it. You're under attack, right? So show of hands, how many actually believe that your office and your business is under attack? Hmm? Not everybody, uh, but quite a few. So trust me, you are. For those that were either too shy to raise their hands or just think you're not, you are. Just trust me, this is, this is a big deal. Everybody out here, it's, it's a constant thing. You're under attack, so, so just believe me. So hunker down with me here, and hopefully we'll get some good stuff out of here, but, but trust me, this, is, this applies to you. Uh, so the good news is, at the end, I'm going to help you sleep like that. Right? <laughs> Do not underestimate the challenge that goes into trying to pick which baby pictures you're going to use, right? Because there are some darn cute baby pictures out there. That's like an hour-long project just to figure out which baby pictures you're going to use. So let's talk about a little bit about what is an attack. Well, first of all, it's not that obvious when it hits you, right? 
So we're talking about cyber attacks, hacks, breaches, leaks, um, viruses, malware, right? Ransomware. They have all kinds of different names on this. Uh, anybody know what the most recent attack was that had all the news? Got mentioned at least twice today, I think. Wanna cry, right? This thing was all over the news. I've never seen something get all over the news like this thing. And I don't know when uh, when Russia and the Ukraine started getting such a bad name. It's like now no one, anytime you mention them, it's always with hacker after it. It's kind of scary. So why do we need to care about this, right? And uh, both Mike and Todd touched on this a little bit. So what happens if you are breached from attack? Uh, certainly some brand damage that happens, right? Your name gets out there that you had a breach. You start doing the no comment thing. Not really good for your, not good for your reputation. There's lost revenue, right? You're gonna lose some money here. The average legal fees, just the legal fees, for small and medium-sized businesses, if they get breached, just shy of $700,000, just for the legal part of it, right? So this is gonna be some serious revenue loss. Uh, stand by for one minute for me. I, apparently we're not plugged in over here somehow. Getting a low battery warning. There we go. Power strip wasn't plugged down. Stupid tech guy. Uh, and, and then the biggest thing, lost time, frustration, right? You don't wanna be that guy. But that's what you look like when you get breached. So we're going to try to avoid being him. Cybercrime stats, it turns out they're kind of useless in this space, in, our, in the small and medium. Everyone here, we're going to call you a small and medium-sized business. But the, the stats for this, they just never come up, right? Uh, they either never get reported or people don't even know they got hacked. So again, we always hear the targets and the Home Depots, all these big guys. And what it does is it lulls us into thinking, well, this doesn't apply to us. It does. You just don't hear about it. Uh, Cybercrime was up 40% in 2016. So this is a growing thing. This is not going away anytime soon. So we need to make sure we're paying attention to it. Uh, I just kind of mentioned this. Small companies just don't make the news. So I spent some time. I tried to go do some online research to try to find some examples of news on small and medium-sized breaches. They're almost non-existent. They just don't get reported. It's just not a thing. But they are occurring at increasing and alarming rates. So they are happening. You're just not going to hear about them in the news. So why are you a target, right? Pretty plain and simple, you have something that the hacker wants, right? Now I know there's a few of you out there, you're thinking, no I don't, you do, right? In your computer system, in your file somewhere, you have social security numbers, you have passwords, banking info, names, right? All they need is a little nugget here, a little nugget there, and they can piece things together. So they don't need to breach you and get all your information. Sometimes they just need a little nugget here and there that they can get from an email or whatever. So. So you definitely have something they want, no doubt about it. Uh, hopefully no one here has ever seen this screen, um, but anybody know what that is? Ransomware. That's a ransomware screen. So ransomware is a revenue stream for these hackers. So what ransomware is essentially is they get an infection on your computer system and they take all your data files and they encrypt them. And they say, if you want us to unencrypt them, you got to pay us. And you pay us in bitcoins. And this could be $500, 1000 2000 and they put a time limit on it. If you don't pay us within 24 hours, the price goes up. Now the good news is that they're fairly ethical hackers, and most of the time, they will actually give you your data back, right? <laughs> because they don't want to get the reputation of, well, we paid and we didn't get our data back, and then everyone stops paying. So a lot of times they will. Now what happens is, a lot of times, they'll give you some of your files back, and then guess what? They'll ask you for some more money, right? Or, what's worse than that, they give you all your files back, you go back to work, they leave an infected file on it, and about two weeks later, bam, you're hit again. Because they know you paid once, you'll probably pay again. And guess what? The second time, price went up. Right? So, this is a big deal. This has become very, very much the common attack that happens now. Because it's easy. If they can get an infection on your computer, this is easy for them to do, and it doesn't take much. And it's an easy revenue stream. So when you think hacker, you, right, we think this guy, right? Hoodie in mom and dad's basement. <laughs> nope. Not anymore. Now it looks like this. Right? There's an entire room full of people that get paid a salary and benefits. Right? This is big business for them. Uh, so they say 20% of the people, so 20% of the people in this room will likely get breached this year. What's that, like one in five? So look around, it's probably four, four people, four or five people in here. Right? That doesn't sound like a lot, unless you're one of them. Then it's a big deal. So definitely something we want to be aware of. Um, 
So one of the things the hackers count on is it's, it's just it's, it's small fees for them, right? But it's a lot of them. They don't need a big score anymore. They need a little here, a little there, a little here, because there's enough small and medium-sized businesses out there that they can get rich off just little things here and there. So it's not a big deal. So that's why small companies are a target these days. So let's dive in a little bit more and start talking about some details. Um, I want to talk to you about where and how these attacks happen. And today I'm going to kind of cover the seven big weak spots of how they're going to get into your network and get into your data. So first up is everybody's favorite topic, passwords. Right? I promise it's not another lecture on change your password every 30 days. So here's the easy one. Um, your, your internet browser, whether it's Chrome, Internet Explorer, Edge, any of those, they will always offer to save your passwords for you. Say no. Do not save your passwords in the browser. The browser basically takes those, stores them in a file that's not encrypted. So when you get a virus on your computer, the first thing it does is go grab that password file and send it somewhere. So bad, very bad thing. Don't do this. So I have an action item for you when you go back to your office. If you've been doing this, go Google how to delete that file and don't ever do it again. This is a very common, easy thing for people to do. Oh, Google's saying I'll save my password? Sure, why not? Save me some time. Get rid of it. Delete that right now. Then I have to remember them. Well, I'm going to get there. <laughs> Polly said I have to remember them. Yeah, that's the problem, right? So how can I remember them all? That's the, that's the, that's the challenge, right? Uh, you can't write them on a Post-it note. But strangely enough, keeping them in a notebook in your desk is probably not the worst idea in the world because almost all these hacks come from outside the building, right? So they're not getting physical access to your building. They're not breaking into your building to steal stuff. They do it from outside. So in one regard, a notebook with all your passwords is not horrible. Now, there's probably some employees in your building you maybe don't want to find that, so it creates a different problem. So that's why it's probably not ideal. But it is better than some of the alternatives, which is using one password for everything. Um, so not horrible. So use strong passwords. Everybody knows this, right? Get a capital letter, get a number, get a symbol. Um, don't reuse your passwords over and over again, right? This is not shampoo. We're not rinsing and repeating here. You want to show you, you really, in a perfect world, you want to have a unique password for every place you have a password, right? Well, that's really difficult. Use phrases, right? I went to the park Saturday, exclamation mark, two, right? So use phrases that you can remember, or a phrase and use the first letter, right? There's some, some, some tricks you can do here to try to make some passwords, but again, think of that. Great, I can have a phrase, but if I need 25 or 30 of them, it's a long road to try to remember which phrase I used where, right? So there's all kinds of tricks to try to do here, but ultimately most of them don't work. And what everyone's up doing is just using the same password. So uh, kind of everybody already knows this, right? I, I know I need to use a strong password, um, but very few do it. Most popular password in 2016 was still 123456, right? So everybody knows this. We just ignore it. Um, that's a fairly complex password. Don't use that one. So this is kind of cool. I'll show you this real fast. I don't actually have this in any handouts. Um, but this is a password tester, maybe. So this is a, the site is howsecureismypassword.net. Okay, you just type in how secure is my password, it'll get you there. But basically you can put a password in here and it's going to tell you how secure it is. It's going to tell you how fast the computer could hack this password. Right? So let's say I use seminar. Seminar. 200 milliseconds. It's under a second, right? That's a useless password. All right, well, let me do this. Let me put a capital S on it. Well, I got it up to 26 seconds. That's useless. So now I start putting some other goodies on here, right? So maybe I'll put a dollar sign, 2017, dollar sign. Three million years before a computer can hack that password. Okay? Well, you guys can't see the, you can't see the box popping up. Where's my box? That's disappointing. Three million years on that to crack that password. So that's a good password, right? Got some numbers, got some symbols, got a capital letter. So that's the kind of thing you're looking to do. But that's kind of a cool site to see how good your passwords are. Then somebody's tapping that site, and now someone knows all my passwords. Yeah, that you're probably smart, right? Probably said, well, somebody could be hacking into that site and gathering those passwords. That's actually a, a site that's sponsored by an internet provider. So in theory, it's safe unless someone hacks into it. So you know, maybe you want to put one in there and then change the last character or something. But good point. Right? So uh, hackers have time, right? This is their motto, right? Never give up. Great things take time. So you know, even five, ten minutes to them, they got a computer cracking on your password. It's not going to get it done. You need something that's going to be up in those millions of years. So eight characters at least. Ten is better. Um, get something that's going to be up in that million count. 
change it at least yearly. You really should change your passwords yearly. See, I told you it wasn't going to be a thing on every 30 days, but 90 days is better. Things that are really secure, like your bank account, want to change those every 30 days. Now, do I? No. But it's really good advice. <laughs> so, But the real answer here is to get a password manager. And I'll talk to you a little bit about what a password manager is. Uh, a year ago, when I did this exact same uh, seminar, the password manager was kind of a, a suggestion. But I wasn't really strongly advocating for it. But now, it's really the only way in the world to combat this problem. Um, it's just, it's, it's really almost 100% must. I don't know what else to say. Um, so how a, a password uh, manager works is basically all you have to remember is one master password. And you use that to unlock your vault. And then all your other passwords are sto stored in the vault. And what you do for the passwords that are stored in the vault, you let the password manager actually create the passwords for you. So it creates these 20 character long, very complex passwords that you can possibly remember and nobody could ever guess. So, and what happens is there's plugins for your phone, for your browsers, for your computer. Once you unlock your vault with that master password, it will take those passwords and plug them in when a site comes up. So you go to go to your bank, the login comes up, the password manager says, oh, I know this site, and it'll actually give you the option to fill in your username and password, and then go, right? Great way to manage the passwords. Does it cause a little bit of inconvenience every now and then? Yeah, it does. I go to pull up something on my phone, and the password manager doesn't click in, and I've got to go kind of do some copying and pasting. But it's certainly better than getting breached, right? So strongly recommend doing this. It's a couple different types. I'm going to kind of skip over a little bit of this because it's kind of boring. But there's password managers that store your data up in the cloud, and there's password managers that don't. And they keep it local on a thumb drive or on your computer. Obviously, the more things that are out in the cloud, the potential the password manager gets hacked, and they get all your passwords. Right? But if you're traveling around at all, if you're using anything more than one computer, you need to get this up in the cloud and get it where it's accessible. And it's one of those things that's a lesser of two evils. But this is all they do. You're trusting that they're hopefully not going to get hacked. If they do, they're pretty quick to alert you. And there's a button in there where you can, it'll, it'll go out and massively change all your passwords. So as opposed to the other options, this is really the lesser of two evils. Um, Cloud-based are obviously very convenient. Uh, but sometimes when the more convenient, you give up some security. So it's just a balancing act. But as we become more mobile society and we're traveling around and we've got phones and laptops and tablets and multiple computers, you really want this stored up in the cloud and you just, and you just got to deal with the possible consequences. Uh, I, I use and I recommend LastPass. Uh, LastPass is generally one of the top rated ones on any kind of reviews or any kind of sites that, that track this kind of thing. Uh, but there's a, there's a bunch of these out there, pros and cons to each. One of the things I like about LastPass is it's really, it's out there for every device. Macs, Windows, Android phone, iPhone, Chrome plugins. It's really got the full coverage to be able to work with almost, almost, almost any device. I've never had a problem with it. it. Causes some inconvenience every now and then, but really it's, it's, it's been a lifesaver. And here's why it's a must. I have 340 passwords stored in my password manager. You cannot remember 340 different passwords. You can't even create 340 different passwords. So without that, you're basically going to start reusing passwords at, at multiple sites. And that's when you start getting into trouble. One site gets hacked, they get your password, and now they have a password potential that you've, you've used at other locations. So that's why that's problematic. Out of those 340 passwords, 100% of them are strong, and there's not one reused anywhere else. So that's where the power comes at. So last pass, strongly recommended. Second up to talk about, this is where most of the, the breaches occur. This is where they're getting into your network. Email. Right? There's check scams, lotto scams, purchase scams, print scams. Right? Every day an email shows up that's got some kind of scam or somebody asking for money or someone trying to trick me into something. Right? Email is where the big weak link is. Two ways this happens. They either send you a link in that email that's going to take you somewhere that you don't want to go or it's going to send an attachment that has some virus code in it that's going to infect your computer. Those are the two things that come in via, via email. So those are the two things we're going to watch for. Essentially two types of attacks. You hear this phishing and you know, I think I'm going phishing. No, this is, this is not anything near as fun as phishing. So there's two types of these phishing attacks. There is one that's blind phishing. This is where they take an email and they massively send it out to millions of people and they hope they get a few. Right? This is a simple numbers game for them. Right? They send it out there, they're going to hope they get a few people to click and they're going to get what they want out of that. Uh, Oftentimes, this is pretty obvious, right? If I get an email from Chase Bank and I don't bank at Chase, pretty easy for me to know that's not for me and I could ignore it, right? Now, the people that do bank at Chase get that and probably going to get a few people here and there that click on that, and now we're off to the races. The other type, uh, the, actually, the, the most famous uh, blind phishing attack was, a, was an Ashley Madison hack. Hopefully, nobody in here is familiar with Ashley Madison, but I can see from some of the chuckles that you are. Um, 
for those that aren't, their, their tagline is life is short, have an affair. Okay? So here's how this worked. They got breached. The hackers got 37 million user information. 37 million people's user information. Right? So then what happened is, some clever people, I'm not saying they were ethical, but they were clever, not the people that even did the hack, created some emails, did a blind phishing attack, and sent it out to guys. Sent an email out to a bunch of guys that said, we have your Ashley Madison account, and we're going to get it out and share it unless you pay us. Okay? Again, if you don't have an Ashley Madison account, pretty easy to sniff that out. If you do, and you're a little paranoid about that, you might want to click on the link and go see what's up. Bad news. Okay? Now, this is where it gets good. So they had 50% um, of those got opened that they sent out. Now, here's where it gets good. Next, they sent it out to women. Again, got a link in there that's going to take you to an infected site. And this one said, your husband had an Ashley Madison account, and we have the access if you want it. Click here. Want to take a guess what the open rate was on that? 90% clicked on that. Took them to a link with an infected site, and they got infected. Right? Again, not very ethical, but awfully clever. Other type of phishing attack is what's called spear phishing. This is more of a targeted attack. This is where they are going to take something they know about you and they are going to target you in your business. Seeing a lot more of this. This again, this is a professional business. So they get pretty sophisticated with this stuff. So what they will do is they will target a, a small and medium sized business that they want to go after and they will gather some information and then they're going to target a campaign specifically for that business. And why do they target small and medium sized businesses? The same reason some people in here didn't raise their hand. Because small and medium sized businesses think, not going to happen to us, we're not vulnerable. So that's why they go after it, because it's kind of it's low hanging fruit. And there's a lot of us. So what do these look like? Now I could take the entire hour to go through these, right? And uh, Todd Mike I know had some great examples on some stories. There are story after story on how clever this gets. On how somebody sent an email, right? You get an email from your CFO, you're the, you're the controller at the office, CFO emails you. Transfer $30,000 to this account. Okay, well, the CFO asked me to do that all the time. Transfer the money. Well, it turns out it wasn't the CFO, right? It was a spoofed email that didn't come from the CFO, and now that money's gone, and now you gotta call, you got to call Mike and Todd. So here's one. So this person uh, was arranging a phone call with me and their boss. A bunch of emails going back and forth. We get the call arranged. The next day, I get an email from this person that says, oh, I've shared an item with you. It talks about shared PT notes, which I didn't quite know what that was. And then there was a link. Now, the link... I expanded out down there, was going to a, a URL shortener. So they, there's all these kind of URL shorteners out there that will take a very long link and they'll shorten it up. Well, the other thing it does is it makes me hard to see where it's actually taken me. So I wasn't really expecting a file from this person, uh, so I didn't click on that, but that was going to be a problem. But again, I had just started emailing with this person in, in the last week. So somehow she had an infection or somebody had access to her computer and they put together an email that came over to me. Now, if, if I was expecting a file from this person, a lot more chance I click on that, right? Uh, this one isn't even particularly well done. Uh, you look at the from address and it's got a bunch of gobbledygook up there. Uh, the to isn't even to me, right? Um, and then uh, it says you have a contacts. It's kind of vague, right? So this isn't a particularly well done. Most people are going to probably sniff this out and go, nah, I don't know what quarterly report. I'm not expecting a quarterly report from anybody. And it, it, oh, yeah, it is yeah, quarterly spelled wrong, right? Um, so that one's pretty easy. This one is very well done. So this came from American Express, and it's telling me I need to. I have an account alert. That'll get my attention, right? An account alert from American Express. I am an American Express card holder. Um, check out online with confidence and in introducing Safe Key. Okay, Safe Key is an actual American Express thing. So this is a real looking email. And if you look at the link, so again, I mouse over the link, and it's, again, it's one of these link shorteners, so I can't tell if it's going to American Express. Now, chances are American Express isn't going to use a link shortener. Why? Because they want you to know it's going to American Express. Right? So, and again, this is a legit thing. I went to American Express and they had this, but I wasn't about to click on that. So, um, if you're not 100% sure, if you can't verify it, just skip it. All right? Go to the American Express site instead and go look for safety and see if you need to get signed up for that. If you have any suspicion at all, even if your radar goes up a little bit, just stop. Right? But again, that one was very well done. It looked like a legit American Express email. It had their logo. It had all their good stuff in there. But there was just a couple things that just didn't smell right, and I stayed away from it. Uh, here's another one that, again, uh, not done very well. 
So this is from Chase online, from a Gmail account. Chase probably not using their Gmail account. <laughs> Uh, it's talking about, uh, it's got an attachment to the Chase Identity Theft Kit. Uh, this is to inform you of the new system upgrade. So again, the English is a little spotty in here, right? So there's typos, there's some things that aren't quite right. Um, but you can't go by that anymore. It used to be that if had, most of these, five, ten years ago, the English was always horrible. Not anymore. Now there's entire sites where they can plug things in, it'll give them good English translation back. So do not go by that. Perfect English does not mean anything. Um, but what they did here is they used the fear to motivator. Right down here. Your online access will be terminated, will be treated as dormant. Well, that's a little bit of a funny word, too. But a lot of times they're going to tell you that there's a problem. Your account's been hacked. You need to do this. But they're going to use fear and they're going to use urgency to try to get you to shortcut some of your, your smarts and, and click on what they're trying to get you to click on. Um, and I don't think Chase signs off Chase Online. It just seems kind of impersonal. The, the PDF that came attached to this looks pretty good. When I open this, that's a pretty good, looks like it came from Chase. Got the Chase logo. It's got some nice footer down there that looks like Chase. Uh, now, again, the tip here was, so that Chase.com link, when you actually moused over and looked at that link, here's where it's going to. Now, they actually have a Chase.com in there, but that's some gobbledygook at the end. The site this is really going to take you to is this APALab.pl. Right? I don't know where that goes, but I don't want to find out. Right? So that's bad news. So again, mousing over the links is always a good idea to sort of look and see if it looks like it's taking you where you, where you think it's supposed to be taking you. So what happened if somebody actually clicked on that link? Well, I did this at our office. Now at our office, we have some top-notch layered security, and it actually caught this, and it said, oh, that domain is blocked to a security threat. So one of our security tools knows that that is going to take us somewhere that we don't want to go, and it's going to keep me from going there. We will absolutely talk uh, about the layered security later. Because again, this is all about education and tips today. But no matter how much you educate, no matter, eventually someone's going to click on something they shouldn't. And then you want to have the technology there to back that up. So this one was fairly easy, unless you're in a hurry, right? Being in a hurry can really cause you some trouble in this case. So it says it came from UPS, but again, the email is from centrytel.net. But it's a UPS delivery failure. I do get these, right? When UPS delivers things, you get notices. This looks pretty good. Um, your parcel has arrived at April. Again, typo, but if you're in a hurry and you just notice the date, you look at, oh, here's my label. I'm going to open that up and print it out. So again, not well done, but good enough that if you're in a hurry, it's possible you just open that label up. I'm, you're heading out the door to come to the seminar. I've got to get that label real fast, give it over to somebody. Big trouble. Here's what a legit one looks like. This is from the state of Illinois. They actually do some things right. Um, there's no links. There's no attachment. It just says there's some that feeds your attention. If you got any questions, call us. Okay. So again, nothing to worry about in there, so I figure that's probably fairly safe. We'll talk a little bit later out why maybe it isn't, but, uh, but that one's, you, you know when there's no links and no attachments, you're probably in pretty good shape. All right, so what happens if somebody does goof up and click on something, right? What's your instinct, right? I'm going to punish them. I'm going to make a sample example out of you. Nope, wrong answer, right? You don't want to punish them. You actually want to praise them and publicly praise them. Because what you want them to do is when they make a mistake, and they're going to, and something happens, you want them to come to you and tell you. And you want to get the IT group looped in as fast as you can. Because the sooner you try to take care of this, the faster it's going to be. Um, and generally it means you need some more training. right? So publicly thank them. Make a big deal out of it. Do not punish them. Do not try to sweep it under the rug. You want to actually use this as a training exercise and a training tool. right? And it's going to happen. So you want to encourage them to bring that to you and then get it to the IT group right away. If there's any suspicion that something's wrong, you want to get to the IT group. Don't go, eh, I'm sure it was nothing. No, it probably was something. So third item up out of our seven is emails little brother websites. Uh, there's two places that websites cause problems. One is legitimate sites that actually get infected. And then there's sites that are not legit at all. Um, so just like malware can infect your PC, websites can get infected. Right? Somebody has a hole in their, their web database, Hacker gets in, puts some malicious code on the website, you go to visit it, bam, infections on your computer. Um, so this is really just another delivery method for them to get to you. Uh, the non-legit sites, you know, you're trying to go to Starbucks and you type Starbucks and you end up with a site that looks just like Starbucks and you don't even notice, but it turns out it's a not a legit site. And now they're, hey, put in your Starbucks login and, you, and uh, username and password. Now they've got that from you. So uh, I'll give you some tips later on how to deal with this. But, but websites are, again, the next common source for them to get infected onto your machine.
So estimates say that uh, at any given time, 25% of legitimate sites are infected. So a lot of infection out there. Think of how many sites you visit every day. This is one of those that it, no amount of training can fix this, right? Because you're going to go to the American Express site that you go to every day. This is where the technology can help, uh, where you get the right tools in place that hopefully can, can catch some of this before the infection gets on your machine. So this is the one thing we'll talk about today where it's not an education thing, where you need the technology to back that up. Now, the 25% may or may not sound like a lot, but it only takes one, right? One person to click on one thing, and now you know you got an infection in the office, you got data leaking out, you got it spreading around the office. All of a sudden, your file's got ransomware on it, and you got a big old problem. You're off trying to figure out how to buy, uh, you know, bitcoins. Um, and now I know everyone here is smart. Everyone here says, "Ah, I'm very good at this. I always pick these out." But can you say that for everyone in your office? Every single person in your office is a potential potential hole for your security. Uh, so this is that screen I showed you earlier. This was me trying to visit a legitimate site, right? The site I go to all the time. I went to go to it, and it happened to have been breached. Uh, and my our layered security caught this and prevented me from getting an infection. Again, I hadn't done anything wrong. Went to the same site I'd gone to the day before, but it happened to be infected that day, and that was going to be a big old problem. If it wasn't for our tools, I would have had an infection and had the, my IT guys over yelling at me, which is kind of ironic, but it happens. One click to one site right, can cause a huge loss of time, revenue. And again, I keep emphasizing this. It only takes one. It only takes one person, one click, one file. Uh, the amount of frustration that comes from this is immense. Businesses close over this kind of stuff. They do, right? Between the, the, the damage to the reputation, between the money, the time. So this is it's serious stuff. You know, you, This is not the kind of thing you want to be uh, closing up your business over. It's just, it's just such a frustrating use of time and money for everybody that we really want to try to do the, keep the education high to keep that from happening. Remember, you're under attack. So fourth up, we're going to talk about public kiosk computers. So these are kind of things in a hotel. You go in a hotel and they got some computers there, or maybe an airport. But basically, it's a publicly accessible computer that you can walk up to and do. So a 2014 FBI survey found that 50% of hotel kiosk computers were infected with key loggers. Key loggers are essentially a thing that logs every key you type. So you go onto the hotel computer, you go log on to your bank, and they're capturing your username and password as you're typing it in. 50%, that's a lot. So they're very convenient to use. You know, use them to look up your boarding pass, but maybe make a look up a good hotel, a restaurant uh, recommendation, but not much beyond that. Never put anything that requires a password, any private information, none of that. Avoid these computers like the plague, right? Because they're just, it's an unknown thing. That hotel, you really think they're taking security as seriously as you'd like them to? Probably not. So be very careful about that. It's kind of becoming a less issue as people travel with, with phones and all that, but sometimes you're just walking by, oh, I want to check this real quick. Don't do it. So I know this starts to start a little dark and gloomy. And, oh, man, this is but But remember, stay with me here. The good news is coming. I'm going to give you some tips to help prevent this. But I've got to educate you a little bit on where it comes from first. So we're getting there. Fifth up, right? We've only, we only got seven of these, so we're almost there. Public Wi-Fi, right? There's Wi-Fi everywhere now. Beware of any open public Wi-Fi that's not encrypted, right? Essentially, any data that's passing over that is not encrypted. It's really easy and convenient to get on, but again, convenience often the opposite of security. So the more convenient it is, the probably the more it's going to open you up to some trouble. Um, certainly, you don't want to be putting passwords in there. Again, it's critical information on an unencrypted Wi-Fi. The other piece that comes in here is you've got to be aware of fake hotspots. Right? So what somebody will do, again, you're at Starbucks, and the Starbucks Wi-Fi is called Starbucks Guest. And then there's Starbucks Guest 1 that Starbucks didn't set up. The hackers got it set up outside in the patio. Right? These are hard to catch. Right? So again, this is a tricky one. But if anything looks a little suspicious, go up and ask them what their Wi-Fi is. Or even better, if you're not sure, just don't go on to it. Just stay away from it. Um, and the other thing they can do, so you go to that, you go to that Starbucks web page, they can start offering you up fake web pages when you're surfing through that. So you, you, again, you think you're going to American Express, they're giving you a fake American Express web page to capture your, your private information. So again, they can be pretty clever. Uh, if you're using public Wi-Fi at all, uh, what I used to say was, eh, if you're using it quite a bit, you want to get a VPN on your device. This is, again, now a must. If you're using public Wi-Fi at all, get a VPN. Um, there's a ton of them out there. They're very little investment. Uh, I've been using Safer VPN. Um, I pay for a year up front. It's less than 100 bucks. Do they cause some problems every now and then? Yeah, they do. It disconnects. Sometimes they have trouble with it. But again, it's way better than the alternative. So 
you definitely want to get that again. I have it on my phone, I have it on my, my tablet, my laptop. And it's pretty clever, they did an update to it recently. If it senses an open Wi-Fi network, it actually starts the VPN automatically for me. I don't even have to do it. And that VPN is there to encrypt all that traffic that goes over that, and you're way less likely to have somebody sniff that out on you. But number six, thumb drives, USB drives, um, flash drives, sticks, pocket storage, doesn't matter what you call it. I actually have one in my pocket. These little, you know, carry these around with you, right? These things are trouble. They seem nice, they're very handy, but they're trouble. And here's why. Um, they're just dangerous. So what happens, you go to a trade show, walking through a trade show, and oh, it's a beautiful girl there. She's handing out thumb drives from XYZ Corporation. Oh, you want a two gig stick? Sure, absolutely. Who doesn't want something free, right? Take it. A couple days later, you plug it in. Well, guess what? I was infected with malware. Because that person wasn't even supposed to be there. It's not even a real company. Right? The handy things, they do this, right? Get the, the buff looking guy handed it. Yeah, I'll take a USB stick. So they did this at a black hat convention, right? These are the black hat hacker guys, right? They handed 200 of them out at this show to the black hat. Now, who should know better than these guys, right? This is what they do for a living. They're like hackers. Handed out 200. How many do you think got plugged in? 197, right? And the three that didn't, they probably misplaced them in their luggage, right? <laughs> so, so this is a big old problem. Um, it's, it's also a great way for employees to steal data from you, but that's a, that's a seminar for a different day. Uh, so what hackers do is they'll drop these in a parking lot. Again, they, they decide they want to target somebody in this building, and they'll take buy a hundred of them. You know, they can get a hundred of them for a whopping dollar probably. They put some malware on them. They spread them around. People pick them up. Oh, someone lost their thumb drive. I'll plug it in and see what's on it. Bam! Whole office is infected. Right? They'll come in. They'll even leave, they'll come into the building and put them around in the building. Put them on desks and tables. Right? Again, they're pretty clever when they want to be. So the catch here is, if you don't know where it came from, you're not. If you don't trust it 100 percent. Don't plug it in, right? You can get these for a dollar. Don't, right? Even at a trade show, what seems to be a legitimate company, if you look at it and you're not, you haven't asked, don't do it. Uh, seventh up is phone scams. So this is the last one we're going to talk about, and then I'll start getting into some ways to prevent some of this. Um, so now, if, if only it were that easy, right? If the caller ID would say scammer calling, I think it'd be a lot easier. But it's not. So the deal here is they're going to call you and try to extract some information out of you, right? Things like your social security number, your date of birth credit card information, right? Bank info. It's an endless list of things that they want to try to get from you and they're going to try to do this over the phone. First thing is caller ID means nothing. I don't care what it says on the phone on the caller ID when you pick it up. I can make that say anything. I can make the phone number be anything I want and I can make the caller ID say anything I want including IRS, Harris Bank, doesn't matter. So trust that not at all. Um, the other thing is they're going to have this down. Right? They're going to be good. They're English is going to be impeccable, and they are going to be on spot on. Right? They're good at this. Remember, they're professionals. Um, again, there's entire call centers, people working eight hours a day, getting benefits to try to extract that information out of you. This is their profession, and they're good at it. So here's how this goes, right? Caller calls you up and says, "Up, oh, calling from the IRS or your bank or your credit card company." Okay, and they're going to present you with some information that they have. The last four digits of your social are this. The last four of your credit card are this. And they're going to give you some valid information that now you start letting your guard down. And then they're going to ask you for a little bit more. And your guard gets down and you go, okay, um, I'm going to give that to you. Again, they're going to use that fear and urgency. I'm calling from Harris Bank. You've had a breach on your account. I need to verify who you are so we can get this taken care of. They're draining your money as we speak. Right? Oh, panic sets in. You can stop thinking and you start giving. And that's where it gets to be a problem. Uh, you owe us money, right? Big, oh, okay. IRS calls and says you owe us money. They usually get your attention. Um, they're going to give you names and badge numbers, right? They're going to give you some official sounding stuff. A lot of times, they'll, this, they'll actually, so one of the ways to combat this is you say, listen, this sounds a little suspicious. I want to call you back. Okay. And they give you a phone number to call back. Great. Well, it's not calling the IRS. It's calling their call center. IRS, can I help you, right? Or whatever it's going to be. So don't trust the phone number they give you. Go look it up and call separately. Now, where this gets really clever is, so now what they'll do is they'll, they'll actually give you the real phone number of the IRS. Great. Try calling the IRS to try to confirm that they're trying to reach you, right? You call, you get bounced around, you talk to six different people, you're not sure. Ah, whatever, I'm just going to ignore it. And then they call back the next day and they say, oh, we know you reached out to us to try to verify this, we're calling you back, right? And again, they start doing this multi-phased approach and you start letting your guard down and it's, and it's real easy to get sucked into this because, again, they're good. 
The other thing you'll see is you'll see these come together, phone and email, right? You'll get an email one day and a phone call the next. And you'll start getting this, where it's, it's, it's like it's a sales and marketing thing. It's multi-touch, right? Send you a letter, they'll call you, they'll email you. Again, it's sophisticated. So you really got to be careful of what's going on. Jury scams, they'll tell you you missed jury duty, you got a warrant out for your arrest. This is a big one, right? Um, and again, they'll leave a phone number on there that maybe is actually the legit phone number. You try to verify you can't get any, and then they call back the next day, and they actually get you on the phone, and, and whoa, you know, so. Um, and again, the key is they'll start feeding you information because they have enough information on you, they just need a little bit more. So, for example, they may have your credit card number, right? Somewhere your credit card got breached from Target, they have your credit card number, but what they don't have is a three-digit security code on the back. So what they'll do is they'll call you, say it's your credit card company, they'll read you the entire credit card number. Well, you have my credit card number, you must know what you're doing. We just want to verify that you are who you are. Do you have your card in your possession? Yes, I do. Could you give me the three digits on the back? Sure, absolutely. You give them the three digits, now they got that one other piece of information they needed. Right? <laughs> Excuse me, but again, these will always start with them giving you, giving you information. As soon as someone starts asking you for information, even simple stuff, right? your middle initial, I don't know. As soon as they start asking you for information, you want to get your guard up, right? Start asking them questions back. As soon as you start asking questions and you start sounding suspicious, they're going to hang up and move on, right? As soon as they think the gig is up, they'll be done, right? Get a phone number, hang up, credit card company, call the number on the back of the card. If it's your bank, go look up the number for your bank and call it. Don't, don't take the number they give you, but again, the catch here is, as soon as they start asking you for something, get your guard up and uh, just pay attention to what's going on. Um, so here's an example, I mentioned this two-prong approach. So again, not very ethical, but kind of clever. So what they do is they'll call up your office, your receptionist answers, and they say, oh, we're doing a digital copier survey. We want to know what kind of copier you have. Probably pretty easy. Oh, it's no harm in me telling you. We have a Canon 3400 image runner. Great. I ask a few other questions, thanks, they hang up. About a week later, somebody in your office gets an email that says it's a scanned document from your Canon 34 image, image runner. The same looking email they got last week when they actually scanned a document or somebody scanned something for them. Looks perfectly like what it would. Because now what they've done is now they know what copier they have. So instead of doing this blind phishing, now again, it's targeted and it's a two pronged approach where they got the information they needed to put together a campaign specifically to target you. Right? And I am not making this stuff up. This happens every day. Does it work every time? Nope. They don't need it to work every time. They only need it to work once, right? And if Joe didn't click on the email, well, guess what? Sally's getting one tomorrow, right? And you're getting one the day after that, and they'll keep sending them, right? Uh, so what's one of the big common threads amongst all of this is it's the employees and the people. That's where the big weak leak comes from. It's, the, it's not the technology, it's the people. The tech is a part of it for sure, but the people are the weak link. Newest employees, they're the weakest, right? So you want to put a training program in place that starts from day one. Part of your onboarding orientation, you need to educate these people on how to protect themselves in your business. This needs to be ongoing. It needs to be constant. You need to keep the security education front and center for your people so that they know. Because it's front and center in mind for a little while, but then it drifts off. I'm busy one day, an email comes in, I got a little lazy, I was a little quick again, and now it's all done. All that, all that work you did was done. So early, often, and ongoing. And I'm going to give you something later to help you with that. So uh, as part of some emails that went out, uh, we asked everybody to take a security survey to evaluate your kind of personal security. Um, there was a range of scoring on this. You scored in the 10 to 20 range, so hopefully everybody took that, wrote down what their number was or remembered what it was. Um, 10 to 20, you're awesome, great. 20 to 30, pretty good. 30 to 40, eh, not so good. And then the 40 to 50, uh, you better talk to us afterwards. You've got some problems we need to talk to. Uh, the average for the group that took this, I think about 10 people in here to, uh, actually took it, uh, average was 26, right? So in the middle of that good range, not bad. I think a few of you were lying, but I won't decide who that was. Uh, I scored a 21, right? So not great for the CEO of an IT company. But there's some things in there like you change your password every 30 days. Nobody changes your password every 30 days. Um, but I felt pretty good about that. It was in the lower end, lower end of the good, so I didn't feel too bad about that. 
There is a paper copy of that survey in your swag bag, in your goodies bag. So take that back to the office, take it home, have some fun with your spouse with it, whatever. Uh, but you can actually take that and the, the ranges are on there as well. So, so not bad, not, not a bad group. So let's start talking a little bit about how I'm going to get you sleeping like that, right? Remember, remember the baby picture? There's another one, right? Um, so don't worry about capturing all this. In a little while, we're going to actually give you a sheet that has these, all these tips I'm going to give you all summarized on the sheet. So you don't need to write any of this down. Talked a little bit already about education. Education, education, education. All right, so we just spent an hour and a half now. We're going to spend an hour and a half doing this plus the Q&A. That's a good first step. Uh, we need to get this back to your staff. We need to put some education in place so we are passing all this information along to everybody at your office. And again, I'm going to give you something to help with that later. But I cannot emphasize enough how important this education piece is. Because again, remember, the people are the weak link. There was, a, was it Mike or Todd? It was Mike, right? The, the, the insurance companies, they don't like stupid. Right? Oh, you clicked on the link? Well, we're done. All right, so don't punish them, right? You're going to get this. It's going to happen, right? The barb in the office is going to click on the thing, and he's going to not want to come tell you, right? Encourage people to share it with you, right? It's going to happen. Just know it is, and just encourage people to come bring that to you. Uh, Tips on pastors. I used to have a bunch of tips up for you. The tips for the pastors is get a password manager. It's really all I can tell you. It's really the only solution for this these days. All right, how do you protect your email? We talked about this being the biggest source of trouble. All right, get a great spam service. If you do not have an enterprise level spam service filtering your email out, this is the first thing you need to do because this will keep 90% of it from ever showing up in your mailbox in the first place. The less it shows up, the less there is for somebody to click on. So you want to make sure you do that. Slow down. Got to slow down and take your time. Think before you click. All right? Look at the link. Take a peek at it. Sort of goes hand in hand with slow down. Uh, common sense. Who's this coming from? Am I really expecting a quarterly report from Joe? No. Am I expecting this from my... No. So, again, if you're not expecting it and it's got an attachment or a link, be, be on guard. Um, look at the from address. Right? See what it's coming from. Look at it. Is it really coming from who it says it is? Has it got a funny uh, email address in there? All these are warning bells that tell you stay away. Um, if there's links in there, put the mouse over them and see what actually link it's taking you to. If it doesn't look like exactly what it should be, avoid it, right? Very few legitimate companies are going to send you a link. Why? Because they know this is problematic. If Harris wants you to go look at your account, they're not going to stick a link in that email because they know you're going to be suspicious of it and probably not click on it. So very seldom are legitimate emails going to have links and attachments. So that already sets off some warning bells. Uh, again, any doubt, don't click on it, right? Just pick up the phone and call. Uh, and then the last one is, if you're using Gmail and Yahoo for your business email, stop. Domains are cheap. Email's easy to get. Get off those. Those are high areas for getting breached, right? D Gmail is ubiquitous. Everyone's got a Gmail account. So this is a very, very common place to get breached. They're going to get some passwords out of there. They're going to get access to your email. As soon as they get access to your email, they know a whole lot about you and you start getting these targeted attacks. You know, all of a sudden you're getting an email that says, you know, they know your daughter's overseas in Europe traveling, and all of a sudden you get an email from your daughter, and it's going to say exactly where she's at because they read your email that you sent her the day before. Right? So you want to keep them out of your email. There's a lot of information in there. Websites, right? Uh, you've got to get the right layered security package in place. It can obviously help you with that. Make sure you talk to your IT group. Used to be you'd put some desktop software on that, that was an antivirus software. That's not good enough anymore. You need a layered approach where there's multiple things uh, combating that. Don't guess at URLs. Don't take a guess that it's AmericanExpress.com. Search for American Express and go hit their link. Because a lot of times, what you think is going to be their website, and you type it right into the address bar, and you get a letter wrong, and you don't get it quite right, and it's going to take you to, to a malicious site. Uh, search for the company, right? Again, don't put the URL in there. And when in doubt, something looks suspicious, close it and start over. Right? Anything looks funny. Uh, public kiosks, uh, very limited on these. Right? If you can avoid them, avoid them. Use your phone. Um, never put anything confidential in there. Uh, no passwords, no credit card, nothing personal. Right? You want to do something, search for the restaurant down the street. Beyond that, these are toxic. Uh, Wi-Fi and hotspots, you know, I got some tips in here, but again, you've got to get that VPN in place. Um, make sure it looks like a legit spot that you're connecting to. Again, limited surfing on this. If you're on a Wi-Fi and you don't have a VPN, very limited on what you're going to do there. Uh, nothing confidential. Same advice. No passwords, no credit card, no personal information. All right, and again, the real answer, just get a VPN, spend the $100 for the year, get it on there, um, and when you're connecting to a public Wi-Fi, 
start the VPN up so all your traffic's encrypted. It's going to cut down your chances of getting an infection significantly. Thumb drives, right? This is the simplest law. If you don't know where it came from, throw it in the garbage. If you're not sure where it came from, throw it in the garbage. If you know it's not 100% legit, just get rid of it. Okay, that's really the, pretty hard to beat that for some simplicity, right? If I hand you one now, you can trust me, but you better ask me where I got it. Uh, phone scams, you got to be very protective. Be very protective of all your information. Uh, again, remember, sometimes they come in small phases. They might ask you for something small to begin with, and then maybe they're going to come back a week later and ask you for something else. So they don't always ask you for the big take in the, in the first call. Uh, don't be fooled by caller ID. The caller ID means nothing. Just don't even pay attention to it. And ask lots of questions, right? See if you can spook them. Get to sp I had one that came in. Uh, somebody was, wanted a, uh, a website development. They wanted to do website development with us. Um, did you do website development? Yes, we can help you. Had a whole long spec sheet of things they wanted. Back and forth, we gave them a price. They said, okay, let's go. I was like, well, that's weird. I've never had somebody just say go. They never talk to me on the phone. They didn't want to have a meeting. So that was a little. And then they asked the magic question. They said, do you take credit cards? Yeah, we take credit cards. So this is a very sophisticated thing. If anybody here take credit cards for, for anything? So what they'll do is they, they'll basically get you to, so then, so then it came and they said, well, I'm in the hospital, so I need you to take this credit card, but our graphic designer has all our graphics files, but I can't pay her. So what I want to do is I want, instead of paying you $2,000 for the website, I want to pay you $5,000 and then I want you to send a check to my graphic artist. Okay? Hmm. That seems kind of odd. Right? So the catch here is they have a stolen credit card that you're going to use to charge the, the $5,000. And you're going to send $2,000 to the graphic artist, which, by the way, is them. Right? And then what happens? A couple weeks later, somebody reports that credit card stolen. And now it swings all the way back around to me that I took a stolen credit card. So they take the $5,000 back plus some chargeback fees. So now I'm out the five grand plus the two. Right? So really I ended up out of pocket two thousand dollars on that, plus the chargebacks, right? This is this is a mess. So as soon as someone wants to like again, it was fairly suspicious. It seemed legit at first. And then I started asking them questions, right? I said, Well, what's wrong with you in the hospital? Oh, he had cancer and he had this and that. Well, when will you be out? I was having fun with him. I had him on the string for about a week. I was stringing this guy along just to see how far I could get him to go. Because um, then I was trying to get enough information out and I was gonna try to turn him into somebody. I asked him for a phone number. His phone was dead, of course, because he's in the hospital. He had, he had, he had, he had a, everything I would give him. He had a rebuttal for that. He was coming at me with everything. So, and then eventually he just stopped because he knew something was up. So, uh, we won't talk about this real long, but this layered security I've mentioned a few times. Again, spam is the first layer of protection. All right, you want to keep the stuff out of the building, and then the next layer is obviously you need the desktop anti-malware, antivirus software, and then you really want some sort of filtering on your web traffic that's coming in and out of your building. Uh, one of the things we did about a couple years ago is we, we spent about a year researching what we were going to go to next after just the desktop software. And we went to a different desktop software. We went to a web content traffic filtering. Uh, and that cut down infections at our clients by over 50%. Right? So again, putting the right technology in place can certainly help overcome when that education does break down. Uh, backups, I'm not going to talk about this a lot. Um, but when you do get hacked, breached, compromised, whatever you want to call it, um, no matter how proactive you are, no matter how it gets at some point something's going to happen, and a lot of times that backup is your only defense. Right? When that ransomware gets on there and it encrypts all your files, you have two options. Pay them and hope for the best, or restore your backup from two hours ago or an hour ago. Right? So very important to have an enterprise level backup. So what, what's a good backup system look like? Um, you got to have it both an on-site copy and an off-site. Right? It needs to be out of the building and in the building. You want multiple copies floating around. Uh, you should know how long it's going to take you to recover from a full uh, server failure. If your server got infected and was down, you need to know how long it's going to take you to recover from that. If your IT guy doesn't know, or your IT provider doesn't know if you ask them and they can't answer that question, time to start shopping for a new guy because that's a problem. Uh, this has got to be rock solid, foolproof, enterprise level backup. Got a file backup that's really a home th that's not good enough anymore. You need something that's enterprise level and can recover that data in that time you need it. If you can't suffer a server being down for three, three days or your network being without your data for three days, and that's how long it's going to take to recover, you got to get a different system because it's not going to get it done for you. And get it tested periodically. Make sure whoever's doing your backups is doing some sort of periodic testing on it so that, yeah, for two years we've been backing up, and then when you really need it, you find out there's a problem with it, and, and that happens all the time. 
Another baby picture, and I'm maxing out on the baby pictures. Uh, so the best route to sleeping soundly like that baby, I got three action items for you. First one is to have a good either internal IT group or an outsourced IT group. Right? You need experts doing this kind of stuff here. If you're doing it, or your office manager's doing it while they're I'm looking at you. I knew Julie. I knew if I looked at Julie, she would have a smile on her face, right? Julie is my poster child for this. If you got your receptionist cousin doing it at night, that's not good enough anymore. You need experts doing this stuff for you. And again, it's, yeah, it's a cost. It's not really a cost. It's, it's, a, it's an investment because it is way less than what that breach is going to cost you. Remember, places go out of business over this kind of stuff. Um, there's a good book in your goodie bag. Again, Abby mentioned the book we wrote. It really talks a lot about how to go find a good IT provider. Um, what to look for, what not to look for. One of the things we always recommend to people, be wary of someone that wants to lock you into a three-year contract or any kind of contract almost for this kind of stuff. Right? right now, our IT contracts for people are month to month. If you don't like us, kick us out. Right? You shouldn't be stuck with some contract you gotta go, you got to go get Todd to fight your way out of. Right? So be careful. If, if, in, now, a lot of places, they want to sign you into a contract because it looks good on their books. That's fine if there's a three-year contract. Make sure there's an easy out clause, 30, 60 day notice. You ought to be able to get out of that thing anytime you want. So be careful of anybody that wants to lock you in, especially when it's someone you don't know and, and hasn't, hasn't had a proven record with you. Um, so my second tip for you is uh, we have a security assessment that we will come out and do. I strongly encourage you to take advantage of this. Talk in a minute about some special pricing we have going on just for today, just for you guys. Uh, if you have not had a security assessment done on your network, in the last year, you really want to get this done. Right? It's always a good idea to have a, a third party come in and sort of check things out. Uh, my, my, where are the, the sisters? Not, this doesn't apply to you guys. You guys got top-notch IT guys. But no, uh, Ron, you're good. No, but if you haven't had this done in the last year, you really get this done. It's always a good idea to have a third party just check some things out. Um, what we do is we come in, we plug a USB drive in. Right? Um, <laughs> they do. It took me about an hour to convince Julie to let me do this the other day. Really? Are you sure this is okay? Yeah, it's okay. Um, but it runs a, a security assessment on your network. We go away, we kind of analyze that, we come back, we give you kind of a simple report, and we give you all the detailed reports. So that you can take that, give it to your IT guy, give it to your IT group, and say, here's everything this thing found, go fix them. And we'll give you our recommendations. We're happy to come in and fix them for you if you want. But you probably have a guy that you're happy with, a group you're happy with. And again, you run this on any network, you're going to find some things, right? We, we're IT guys, we ran it on a net our network, we found some stuff that we didn't think of. Oh yeah, we didn't think of that. Oh, we put that in place a year ago and sort of, so this is always going to find some stuff. It doesn't necessarily mean you got a bad group. Uh, if it finds a whole bunch of things, you probably do. But you want to go ahead and get this done. Real briefly, I'll cover some of the stuff it, it goes over. It's going to inspect your firewall. Make sure you don't have too many uh, open ports coming in from the outside. Make sure you've got the current firmware on there. It's going to check your virus and malware software. Make sure you have that on every computer and it's up to date. It's going to check versions of SSL certificates. This is the technical mumbo jumbo that even makes Todd and Mike look simple. And bad. Not that you guys are simple, sorry. Uh, it's going to check the status of your backup, right? your business continuity and disaster recovery, and make sure that's working. Uh, if you have an on-premise email server, it's going to make sure that's not set up incorrectly to let people send the email through it. Uh, it's going to check for your password policies. Make sure you have a strong password policy on everybody's accounts. Uh, it's going to check for permissions on data shares and folders. Make sure these don't look like they're too open to everybody. It's going to look for rogue wireless in your office and make sure all your wireless is secure. Uh, and then eventually it's going to give you a detailed report with an overall risk score, which I'll show you in a minute. Looks like that. In fact, I'm going to show you now. Um, so basically it gives you an overall score of 0 to 100. Uh, this was 77. That, believe it or not, that's kind of a typical score. And then so what you typically what happens is we'll come in, we'll do the security assessment, we'll patch up the holes that suggested, and it's going to drop that back down significantly. So anything where it starts getting up into that red is going to be a problem. So here's kind of one, one of the pages out of the 50 that it gives you out of the detailed reports. Uh, it's looking at things like account lockout to make sure if somebody types a password in too many times that that locks the account out. Password history, make sure we're not letting people reuse passwords. Make sure your uh, screens lock when somebody walks away from it after 10 or 15 minutes that locks the screen. So all kinds of detailed things like that, it's going to go out and check and see how well you're doing. Okay. <laughs> right. This used to be a mini me. We would offer to have me come out and do this training at your office for your staff, but we found something better. Um, again, remember, the more they know, the more you can educate your staff, and the more you can keep the security front and center for them, the better off you're going to be. So what we went and did was we have put together an unlimited employee security training. Right? For one flat yearly price, you get unlimited training for all your staff for the whole year. 
right? And it's things like it's online, it's unlimited, and it's self-training, right? They just they watch some videos, uh, some really engaging videos. It's actually fun. It takes them about an hour to go through the whole operation. Um, there's about 20 questions at the end that they have to take, and they have to get 80% or better to pass. And then uh, whoever's the admin at your office, you actually have a login, and you can see who's passed, what score they got, how far they are along. So it gives you a way to self-monitor their training. Uh, and then what it does is, it, it, once they've signed up, it gives them ongoing email security tips. It gives them emails. gives them videos to watch, articles to read. Constant reminders, again, to keep this front and center. Um, the more you can keep the employees thinking about security, the, the less chance something happens. Covers things like phishing scams, phone scams, Wi-Fi dangers. Does any of this sound familiar? All, right, all the stuff we talked about. Clean desk policy, right? Why it's important to keep track of what's on your desk. All the medical people here I know already know this, right? This is a big HIPAA thing. And much, much more. So when I get to the pricing on this, this is a no-brainer. I cannot, if you walk out of here without signing up for this, I'm not sure what I can tell you. This is really, really something you really, really want to do. It's easy. So the videos are fun. They're engaging. People are going to want to do this, and it's going to make them want to learn about security. So right now, uh, Abby's going to hand you out a couple sheets. Uh, one is an order form for, for that and the other, th for, um, I'm sorry, for the security assessment and for the training. And again, some special pricing on that just for today. So I'm going to encourage you to get signed up for that today. Um, and then the second is the tip sheet with the, the summary of the tips that I talked about. So obviously you can take those. Feel free to make copies of those. Do whatever you want with them. I want the more, again, our goal is to help you educate your staff. So let's talk about the pricing on these real fast. Um, so both of these steep discounts just for today. So the security audit normally is $1,600, $1,595. That's almost half price today. Right? That's the lowest we've ever offered this for, $8.95. Right? That's us coming out to the office, doing the scan, going away, preparing the reports, and giving all that data back to you and going over with it with you in English if you want. Um, the unlimited security training is based on how many users you have. And again, so if you have 1 to 50 users in your, in your office, uh, it's going to be $250 for the year with that price today. If you have 51 to 100 users, it's $450. 101 to 200, $625. Between 200 and up to 500, 800, I don't think we have anybody in here more than 500. If you do, talk to us. We can figure that out. And again, this is unlimited. This is, you pay for the year, and you get to go through it as many times as you want, add new employees as they come in, train them, have refreshers every quarter. Uh, you definitely want to do that. Um, again, I think this is a no-brainer. Those kind of, I mean, think about it. Even if you add, what, I think, if we had somebody in here that's doing that 625 a year, for $625, you get to keep everybody in your office educated. Think about the price of one breach is going to pay for that year after year after year after year. Um, and again, we, we talked about the education, how important it is to do the education. And this is essentially completely hands off for you. All you got to do is get the, get, you get, get the person an email invite, and then you're done. Every now and then you check in, check in with them, make sure they're doing it. But it really makes it, it takes the burden off you to try to figure out how to train your staff. So a couple quick takeaways. Uh, you are under attack, right? We've already talked about that. Um, we can help you. This is a big thing for us. We're here to help. Again, we'll do this during the Q&A. But anything after this, if you have any questions, you want to sanity check something you've got going on, uh, my contact information will be up there. You have Abby's contact information from the emails. Reach out to us. We're here to help. Um, even, you, know, you don't need to be a client. You don't even need to be a prospective client. If you've got something we think you can help you with, please reach out to us. That's why we're here. We want to help. Can I ask you a question? Can we sign up for this yearly thing when it renews? Do we have to pay the higher price next year or some like deal? So, it's quarter yeah. so what happens next year? I, I can see why you hired her. Yeah, no, we can, no. <laughs> you keep renewing it, we'll keep renewing it for the same price. Good question, though. Um, and then, so, i got some of our staff here, obviously. Uh, obviously, Abby, you met. Um, Carl in the back. So, if you have any questions after the Q&A as you're mingling around, talk to Carl. Pat's in the back. Um, Bill Tuma's right there. Uh, Bill Tuma missed the dress code today because he's actually here. He's on vacation. He came in just to see you guys. But, so he doesn't have an Andromeda shirt on. Uh, but um, So yeah, so search us out. Say hi. I've uh, met most of you guys so far today, but we're here to answer any questions you got. So as, uh, as Mike and Todd are making their way back up kind of for the Q&A, I did have some pre-submitted questions that we'll kind of I'll just run through real fast. Um, so uh, Sister MJ who's not here, but the, the rest of the crew from the Sisters of St. Francis is here. She asked, how can a company keep a server and network computer safe from phishing techniques uh, when you don't have control over what people search for on the internet? Well, I hope I've answered that throughout the day. If I haven't, I did a really horrible job. Uh, but again, really, that's about this whole education and the ongoing education. So take, t t tell MJ we had to sign her up for some education. We made work for her. 
Uh, next one was from John, who I don't think made it. John, John from Schultz, Precision Make It. Uh, his question was, how important is a disaster recovery plan for a company to have, including insurance, if the company in question is using an outside IT third-party firm like us for all their needs? How much should be covered by the company, and how much should be covered by third-party vendor service? So I actually I tell you what, I'm do me one favor. I'm going to come back to that one because I'll let you guys answer that because that one's I have an answer for it, but it's probably wrong. Um, but I'm going to switch back to here real quick. Uh, Renee, this was Renee's from the Sisters of St. Francis. What is Andromeda's opinion about all the data being stored in the cloud? Is it good practice to eliminate one's in-house server, and how safe would the data be uh, if it were stored only in the cloud? Right. So this is a big topic for everyone. I know that she's not the only person wondering this. Listen, the cloud's not going anywhere. It's here to stay. I'm a little bit of a control freak guy. I love being able to have my data where I can go see it, touch it. I know it's there. But this is becoming more and more a thing, right? There's more and more your data's in the cloud. So this is really almost every office, even if you have data stored in your office, you probably have paths opened up for people to work remotely, for vendors to get in. So really, whether it's in your office or whether it's in the cloud, right, it's accessible to the outside world. Now, the exception to that would be if you really have it closed up and you really don't have any outside access, if you are going to move it to the cloud, well, now you're going to have to open up some outside access so that your office can get to it. So if you really have a completely closed office where there's nothing remote getting in, there's probably something to be said for keeping it in your building. Otherwise, it's probably six one half dozen the other. If somebody, again, if someone's going to target you and they're going to hack in and get your data, they're going to come get it whether it's there or it's in the cloud. Right? So not really a big, huge trade-off there as far as the IT security-wise on that. So I don't know that I can add much more insight to that. Yeah, All right, hey, I'm going to do one thing. So we have a weird. So we have a, we have a microphone that I've had on, but I, but I want to make sure we're recording this, and we want to make sure we record in the Q&A. So we're going to pass this around during the Q&A session. So I apologize, that's a little funky, but and Pat wired me up here. Now I feel like I really need to say something like, yeah, now, yeah. yeah now that we built it up, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Uh, the cloud, from a legal standpoint, is great for us because we can push some of that to somebody else. Uh, if you're going to use Amazon Web Service or some other cloud service, what a great place to push the liability to some deep pockets like that. So from a legal standpoint, we like moving in information and data to the cloud. So uh, from if it serves your technical um, issues. So that was all I had. All right. I feel compelled to say something more profound, but that's all I had on that. All right, so, so if you could pass the buck is what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. All right, cool. Uh, so do you want to take Josh's question about the, uh, the insurance policy and coverage when you have a third-party vendor? Oh, sure. So it's really still important. One of the misconceptions you have is that when I go into organizations, they say, well, I have a third-party vendor who manages my backup and my credit card collection services and everything else. And while that's extremely important, it's a great, when I take a look at insurance, really our focus is risk advisory. So I want to know what are you doing to protect yourself so that insurance doesn't have to play a role. So we put together risk transfer policies. So risk transfer would be a contract between you and your vendor. Those usually have some caps. Um, so they might limit the indemnification. So indemnification clauses, they've got caps, exclusionary, you know, state of, of wording, um, limits that, uh, or types of breaches that can take place that wouldn't be covered. So you're going to have those types of situations where it might even be caused by them, but for some reason it won't be covered by the agreement or they become insolvent because those vendors, you know, they sign indemnification agreements with their other thousand clients. And if they have a breach that causes losses for all their clients, they probably don't have enough insurance to cover that, their own cyber insurance. So you're going to want to make sure you have your own insurance in place to cover yourself for any loss. Because if, if, even if you're using a third party, let's say credit cards, for instance, you're the front end for collecting that information. Under every jurisdiction, you're still going to be named in the lawsuit. So if that vendor can't honor their indemnification agreement or refuses to, you still have to pay for that loss, the defense costs, everything else. So it's still critical that you have your own cyber liability insurance in place. Todd, thoughts on that? No, no, I don't. Yeah, and I, I can add on to that a little bit. I mean, that's the exact same advice we get from our insurance folks, which is important, by the way. Um, but our cyber policy, we actually have a specialized IT cyber policy that we don't get from them, but their advice is make sure that your clients also have a cyber policy because things like even, like a laptop gets stolen out of a car, that wasn't our, that wasn't our gig, right? That was yours. So you absolutely still definitely want to have your own policy on this kind of stuff and absolutely get with your, your agent on that because it's, it's a big deal. You, you, you're not going to be able to pass the entire buck over to us. All right, we'll take what we'll take what we can, but it's it's some of it's going to be on you. So, yeah. all right, all right. So we have some other questions. Yeah, Deborah. 
Um, so if you have your data in the cloud and then your vendor says they have to do the backup in the cloud too, but it's all in one place, like how do you get around that? Yeah, so the question was if you have your data in the cloud and they're doing the backup into the cloud. So yeah, so here's one of the ways we, we solve that with our cloud and our backup is our cloud backup backs up to a different data center, right? So our cloud servers are in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and the backup of that happens and it goes to their data center in Denver, right? So ask the, ask the cloud vendor, where is that backup being stored? Because you want it to be geographically dispersed. Um, and again, most of the, any, any legitimate cloud vendor, and you gotta be careful with, you know, if your cloud vendor is, you know, again, your receptionist cousin and he's got it down in his basement. Um, legitimate cloud vendors are, are very secure. Obviously, it's in, a, it's, in a, you know, it's in a hardened data center. It's in a data center that gets audited. So you want to ask some questions about the data center and the provider that have it. But typically, they're going to be pretty well secure and they're going to have their data centers very well isolated. So if something does happen to one data center, it's very unlikely that's going to migrate across to the backup. Um, but again, part of this is educate yourself. Don't always just take someone's word. Don't take your IT person. Even this guy's been working, it's your IT guy, he's a great guy, he's been there 10 years. Don't always take his word for it. Ask just a few questions to make sure that you can sanity check just some common sense things that maybe nobody ever thought of, right? So, all right, good question. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, let's say you have Salesforce that's always traveling. They're always hooked up, they're using VPN. At the same time, they're using a secure wireless network in the hotel. Um, let's say you're breached, and did they share any of the liability? By the way, in case you didn't hear it, Mike went, oof. <laughs> well, because well, you said the word liability, I guess I have to step in here. Um, I assume that when you get onto the hotel service, you're probably signing some big time disclosures and authorization forms and all of that, which probably aren't all that enforceable in and of themselves, but in the end, you are aware that there's the potential possibility that you are being breached at that point too. So I mean, based on those facts, to give you, one thing lawyers always get shot for is not giving clear answers. I'm going to give you a clear answer and I'm going to say probably the hotel is not going to be liable in that situation. Um, it's going to be you holding the bag essentially. Um, to move one step further to sort of defeat some of that liability, you could have good employee training and that's one thing that we really love to have because when we get called in on a breach, the first thing we ask is, what were you telling your employees when they're traveling? What are you telling them about the Starbucks or what are you telling them about the hotels? That's a great defense for us as far as those things are concerned, but to answer your question directly, I would think that Hilton is sitting there probably pretty safely at this point. So. And I'm sure everybody in here reads those before they sign off on them when they're in the hotel, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, I, and I promise I did not ask Todd to make that education pitch. That was real nice. But that's, and that's one of the things they actually, you know, and when, when the, on, the, on the unlimited education, once they pass it, they, there's a certificate. And I mean, obviously, you can go back and track when people took the test. And so that, that's, that is, I never thought about that time. But yeah, that's, that's cool. All right, I know there's more. I'm going to ask about considered response plan. Was there a question? Yeah, oh yeah, that was the yeah, that was the insurance and the response plans. Yeah, that was Josh from um, oh, who's I not here. But, I misunderstood yeah, yeah. that, but I could talk really. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, awesome. So, uh, we did prepare incident response plans for a number of years, and it was going really well. And I hope I don't step on anybody's shoes here, but uh, then we noticed they were popping up on Google the forms, and you could do your own incident response plan. Uh, in-house, it wasn't that big. So what an incident response plan is, is essentially it just is a game plan where you talk about who's going to respond, internal, external teams, how they're all going to coordinate. So those, the forms were showing up everywhere and you could easily do it yourself and you didn't need a lawyer to draft those for you. So we saw that that wasn't going to go very well for us at all. But the important thing is what is not necessarily the piece of paper we're finding now. It's sitting down and talking about these issues and finding the weaknesses and sitting down with legal forensics and insurance and saying, well, what's our li liability or what's our, you know, our general liability policy going to do? Is that sufficient in a situation like this? How is it coordinating with the cyber coverage? So that's where somewhere where if Mike and I were sitting down together, we could discuss that issue or the forensics issue. What is the data that we're storing? And do we need to be storing all this data? Can we dump some of this data? And is it, are there new programs that we're using that doesn't require us to hold this data? So that's the value that we see in the incident response plan now. Not so much the paper, but just going through the process is what we're really recommending to our clients at this time. So.
I can probably add some of that too. Yeah. No, and, and I don't know how everyone has a different perspective on the Panaman studies, the Panaman Institute, I think out of Michigan, but they do a cost of a data breach study every year. They usually partner with IBM to put it on. And, and the last year, the last time they did one was last June. And what was interesting about that one is it wasn't just the cost of a data breach, but they did ROI for the things you can do to prevent and respond to data breaches. And the number one thing you could do is set up an incident response program. It was like a 16% decrease here in the states, and it varied by you know, you know, various various countries. And we see from an insurance perspective, you can only buy so much insurance. You, know, you can get a five million dollar policy, ten million even. You can get others to kind of layer on top of that, but it gets expensive. So you really have to do work with your IT security firms, with your attorney, set all of this up so that you know exactly what's going to happen. It's been table tested. Everyone knows it. So you can take your average cost of a data breach, which the average here in the U.S. this year is two hundred. $21 or something along those lines and say, okay, so I don't want it to be $221. I'm going to set up the incident response program because it gives me the best ROI to that $221 and take it to $210, to $200, to $150. So you don't have to buy $10 million of coverage to truly protect yourself. You could buy it less and overall it's less costly. So it almost pays for itself. So. I, li I like these guys. A lawyer that said, do the, do the form yourself, but an insurance guy who said, you need less insurance. It's like unheard of. <laughs> The reason we got these guys here. All right, what else we got? Polly, I know, I know Polly's holding on. She, keep, she keeps waiting. Okay, so if you have, or if you have some ran, some ransomware hits your computer, and then you back up to what you had yesterday, is this, that trigger still on there? Good question. Yeah. So the question is, okay, I'm stepping on my paper one. Uh, so the question is, okay, you get a ransomware infection, right? And the question is, we're talking about. Is it possible that that's part of the backup? So yeah, absolutely. Now this is where it gets tricky, right? Because a lot of times the ransomware may have gotten on there a week ago, and maybe it just triggered now. So one of the things that you have to do when you have a breach is we have to go in and try to figure out where the infection is. So the first thing you generally do is store from the backup and then scan the system to see if you can find any more infections. So it's a combination of restore it, scan it, oh, infection's here, and you may have to go back farther. Now that's kind of rare. Most of the time when it triggers, you can almost go back an hour earlier and you're probably okay. Or you can go back an hour earlier and then scan it and remove it. So it's a little bit of a two-pronged approach. It's restore the data and then clean up the infection and make sure you're good. Now, this is never foolproof, right? This is one of, this is one of the things that frustrates the heck out of our clients and, and us is you'll get an infected machine, we come in, we clean it up, we fix it all up, it looks good, everything's good, and then a week later, it comes back, right? I know this has happened to somebody in here, I'm sure, right? Ron, I know it's happened to you, right? Sometimes it's hard to find it all and get it all off. So what, a lot of times you do that once or twice and you go, okay, now we just got to take this machine down to the bare bones, reinstall everything from scratch. But it's, it's challenging to go to, to try to find the balance of, okay, because what you don't want to do is you don't want to have to go back a week to restore your data back because now what happened to that week's, week's worth of data. So it's a two-pronged approach of restore it, try to get it cleaned up. So good question. Okay, Fire it up. So if we find if if we if we find a bad link, is there somewhere we can send that bad link so somebody else can look at it, or we're just they're just all those bad links are just out there in everyone's personal stuff and nobody cares. Yeah. So one of the things like we do, so the spam service that we use, if you get something in that you know spam, you can forward it off to a special address that they will then take that in and, and build that into their algorithms to hopefully keep that kind of thing from coming up again. But essentially, you know, even I, we talked to somebody recently that had a breach. You know, again, it was a small breach. It was a small. They called the FBI, and I think you know you can call the FBI, and I think they'll do some investigation and stuff. But for the most part, you, know, you just delete it and move on with your life. Yeah. It's like part. They, there are uh, companies out there now, though, that will, uh, they're trying to aggregate all the data where you can forward it to them, and they're trying to get, like, uh, warehouses worth of all this data to try to analyze it. So there are some people doing some work in that area. But for the most part, it's, you know, everyone's, everyone's out for themselves. You delete it, move on, and, and that's that. Okay, I have another one. Someone else wants to go first. Someone, someone to knock Polly off her pedestal. Or we, we're going to reward her for we're going to reward her for sitting in the front row. Yeah. <laughs> right, well, we'll let Deborah school. Manager, what about yeah. how do you feel about the password app and have like a biometric thing? Find your phone and back up on I thought it was great until I heard about this BIPA thing. I don't know what this BIPA biometric thing is. Um, no, I mean any you know any security like uh, this new surface that I'm using. Basically, it, it, it has a camera up front and identifies me by my face. Um, you know, any of that kind of stuff, I, I think it's pretty good. I think it's just another layer. Any layered protection, you would, I didn't talk about it today. Dual factor authentication is a lot of talk about, you know, having two factor authentication where you have to both put a password in and it also sends a code to your phone. So it's basically something you know and something you have on you, right? That can get kind of cumbersome, but it's very secure. 
So any of those kind of things where, again, a layered approach where maybe it's going to be a biometric and then a password. Anything you can do that's going to make it more secure I think is better. Are they perfect and infallible? No, they're not. Um, the other thing we didn't talk about at all, but it's very big for the medical folks in here, uh, is because it's a big HIPAA thing, is uh, desktop encryption, encrypting your data on your devices. Um, and this is, again, more of a physical thing. If somebody steals a laptop or someone breaks and steals a desktop device, if you have that data on those, on those devices encrypted, then you don't have to report a HIPAA breach. So that's a big thing we've been doing a lot lately. It's, it's not, not cheap. It's kind of expensive. But it's, again, another layer of protection to, to keep you from having to call the, the boys in. So. Isn't that in Windows 10, though? Uh, with the desktop encryption? Yeah, there is. It, 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 but the problem with the one that's built in is it's not centrally managed. And now you, it, you really want this to be a centrally managed thing your IT guys are going to manage from a central point. If a device does get out of the building, they can remotely kill it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, the password manager thing. Do you yep. do one with LastPass? One for work, one for home? The actual password manager? Yeah. No, it's really one. Now, there are, it, it, there's different folders that you can set up in there. And you can do things like you can share folders. Like you can put all your work ones in a, in a folder and then share that access to somebody else in the office. Or maybe your personal ones in a folder and you share that with somebody in your household. So there is some segmentation you can do in there. But typically, no, you want to have, I mean, you could you could have two accounts. Um, but I, for the most part, again, there's really no reason not to commingle them because it it, if they're going to get breached, they're going to get breached. So that's a different problem. And so the question was, by the way, on password manager, would you have one account for business and one for personal? So. What I'll do, if you want to think of some more, we are up against the two effects. So what I want to do is I want to make sure we do the raffle. Um, and then we can keep taking questions, but I want to make sure if somebody needs to go, we can let you get out of here, but you don't miss out on the raffle. So we will let Abby uh, do the raffle real fast. And then, like I said, we're... I, if, I gotta, if I leave now, I've got to go back to the office, so we might as well stay here and take some questions. And again, we're around. If you something you don't want to necessarily talk about uh, out in the open and get onto the camera, we can talk about that. Grab Carl. I actually grab have one more question. Awesome. So you were talking about the Nest. And, yeah. And then there was also some discussion about what was business, uh, where your, where your um, interest would lie. So if you have a Nest at home and somebody hacks into your Nest, would my homeowners come in? Or do I have to get special insurance? Oh, insurance guy. Gotcha. I, I used to sell homeowner's insurance well over a decade ago. So this is going to, if I remember correctly, what used to go on from what I know now, because Horton does sell it, but it's not my division. I believe they do have some identity theft um, or, or data breach protection on those programs now. It might come so that, like, your homeowner's policy have, like, ten, twenty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 of coverage. Um, in the event something was damaged or you're not going to lose business income because you're a person, right? But let's say you have to replace... Oh, I don't know the thermostat because somebody went in there and blew up the thermostat, right? Let's say your pipe froze and you had it. Oh, exactly, right. You know? So now that's a good question. So you're going to have data breach coverage, and then you know you have to read the po property form, the actual for the, the coverage of the of the home, to see exactly if it's written in what the causes of loss are. So it's going to say fire, water, water backup, right? Just like water backup is a good example. Water backup, you know, where it comes from your drains. It's typically excluded from homeowners, homeowners policies. You have to add it extra, right? So if it's five thousand, ten thousand, twenty-five thousand dollars, well, the reason I got out of homeowners insurance is because I underinsured my parents for water water backup, and they're like, Mike, it's going to cost us twenty thousand, and, and you have us insured for ten, so you're probably bad at this. So I stopped doing <laughs> homeowners insurance. Luckily, my brother was in construction, so he did it for free. But um, so that, that's a good example of they probably have some coverage for that. But check the policy in your eight with your agent. How is it? How would this? Because it's all about the cause of loss. How would this be covered? Okay. So, yeah. And I, I can give you another uh, from the technical side, um, and this is a, what homes, business, wherever. The more of these things that get on the internet, so for the, the standard precautions apply, right? When you take it out of the box, don't use the password that comes with out of the box. Change the password. Make it secure. Right? So the more of these things get on the internet, I, I was at a matter of fact, it was uh, about a year ago, Horton put on a cybersecurity seminar, and they had a, a, a cyber expert come, and he showed so basically, all these things are on here. Basically, what he did was they were able to get in. People are able to get, get in, get into your alarm system, right? Because the alarm system, your burglar alarm system, is on the internet now. You don't change the default password. Hacker gets into it, turns off the alarm. Right? Then he goes from there into your system, and you have your lights on, right? Because it's again house automation. All this stuff starts getting on the internet. Got into the lights. They were able to get into the burglar alarm somewhere. They got and they got basically a basic address. Because again, from some of the internet stuff, they can figure out ballpark where you're at geographically. Then they get into the light system and they turn the front light on and they turn it off and they turn it on and turn it off. And then they drive around in the geographic area and find the light with the, the house with the flashing light and break in. Right? So there's all kinds of these crazy things where all this stuff starts getting on the internet. So you've got to take the same precautions. 
don't, you know, don't have a simple password on your home router. Someone's going to get into that. So it's the same common sense uh, approach that applies to your house as it does at the business. Don't leave the default passwords. Put good passwords on there. Don't use the same password for everything in the house. All those same kind of things. So good question. All right, Abby, you got a got a raffle for us? Well, come on up. Huh? Yeah. Echo. Ah, Amazon. Put the, when you put the Amazon Echo, whoever wins the Amazon Echo, when you put it on your network, change the password, please. <laughs> Because if you didn't, don't be coming to sue us. Oh my goodness. Like, we have set that up. <laughs> okay, so first up, we're gonna, we got three gift or three raffle items today, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, $25 Amazon gift card, an Echo, and a 35-point system security assessment. In case you couldn't tell, we really like Amazon. <laughs> All right, so Nicolette is going to do the drawing. So Great. I don't think you're tall enough to get that above her head. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, and the winner of the echo, should I do the echo? The assessment first? Okay, there it goes. Dave Hofer. Of course. Of course. They just had one. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, we can have the echo. Giant. <laughs> Like a week ago. Yeah, literally, 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 we just did theirs a week ago. Walker. There we go. Okay, so you can talk to Carl after the event and chat about how we can get that handled for you guys. Good news, bad news. You won the assessment. Bad news is you got to talk to Carl. It's all right. A couple minutes. Yeah. Okay, so Carl, you can get that handled for you guys. Thank you. 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 Um, the $25 Amazon gift card. Okay, um, Webio, Cipriani. Nice. Right. Thank you. Absolutely, that's something awesome. Cool. Get it in two days. Hopefully. <laughs> so, uh, any more questions that we can cover in the Q&A panel? Yeah. Awesome, easy crowd. <laughs> All right. Then, uh, like I said, uh, we're here for a little while. Uh, feel free to wander around, mingle. Uh, if you got some forms to hand in, hand them into one of us. Uh, otherwise, we're here for more questions. So, appreciate everybody's time coming out. I know it's hard to get out these days. There's a lot going on. So, thank you very much. We appreciate your time.